This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is episode 235 of the program. Today is Friday, April 3rd, and before we get started, I want to take some time, as usual, to thank all of our newest Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members, all of which signed up for the very first time to support us this week or increased their monthly pledge, and that includes... Artem Kozrenko, Charlie Henderson, Erica Johnson, Espinosa Jennings, Finn Ove Corner, Heather Barassa, Ermi Zen, Joel, Jonas Eichel, Kaylee, Left Hemisphere, Michael DeMarco, Nancy Hodgson, Rose Blake, Sean Best, and Yazin Youssef. So thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you'd also like to support the show and join the independent progressive media revolution, you can do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support, patreon.com slash humanistreport, or by clicking join underneath any one of our YouTube videos as usual. So we've got a great show for you guys this week. We will talk about where we're at when it comes to COVID-19 and how the worst has yet to come. And in spite of this crisis, Joe Biden is still refusing to even consider medication care for all. Democrats think Bernie's presence in the race is hurting Joe Biden and will compare Joe Biden's enthusiasm to Donald Trump's at this point in time. Also, a Joe Biden surrogate rushed to delete her tweets after Joe Biden was accused of sexual assault. And in spite of the media silence, one Democratic Party establishment figure has decided to speak up. Howard Dean. I'll tell you what he had to say about the Me Too allegations of Tara Reid and we'll discuss whether or not AOC has been compromised and talk about the Amazon and Instacart worker strike. And we'll also have more stories, so sit tight. We've got a long episode for you. Hopefully, you will enjoy the program. Let's go ahead and get right to it. So let me just take some time to ask you, how are you doing? Because we're in week three of social distancing and self-quarantine, and I know that a lot of you are going a little bit stir-crazy. So, how are you doing? I think it's important for us to take the time to acknowledge that this is a lot to deal with. Even if we don't know anyone who's been affected with COVID-19, for those of us who have to stay home and are not used to that, this can be really difficult. Like, this is going to lead to depression. It's going to lead to excess anxiety. So I really want people to acknowledge that if you're feeling worse because of the COVID-19 crisis, just know that you're not alone. And there's a lot of people, everyone, <laughs> who's currently experiencing the same thing. For me, um, I'm dealing with quarantine just fine because this isn't that much different than my usual lifestyle, to be honest. But still, it has caused, you know, some depression because it's just, it, it feels so surreal. Like, you see this kind of things happen in movies, but never in real life. You almost think that a global pandemic, this could never happen. But we're living through something that is truly just, it's crazy. So it really is difficult to believe that this is actually happening, you know? Um, and I think that this is going to become very real as more and more people that we know become infected or affected with COVID-19. So, with that being said, let's talk about what's going on when it comes to COVID-19. Last week, we left on a really terrifying note where Donald Trump and Republicans were insisting that we shouldn't allow the cure to be worse than the virus itself. And Trump wanted to reopen the country, reopen the country in whatever capacity he can, by Easter, because the thought of packed churches on Easter Sunday sounded beautiful to him. Now, to me, that sounds like a nightmare. A bunch of elderly people coughing on each other and shaking hands. That sounds horrifying. But thankfully, he has chosen to extend the deadline for at least 30 days. Now, you've just got to play it by ear. You don't necessarily know how long this is going to last. Uh, models predict that we won't peak until mid-April. Now, we don't know how long we'll be in the peak process and when we start to kind of go down 
But um, <laughs> buckle up. We're just getting started. And it's going to be a long ride. But thankfully, Trump is not choosing to send everyone back to work yet to sacrifice them to the gods of capitalism. And Dr. Fauci explains why Donald Trump came to this conclusion. Long story short, because more people that are smart got to him than uh, the dumb people. Take a look. Why have the guidelines been extended till the end of April? Why was that decision made? Well, John, when you look at the kinetics of the outbreak, the patterns that are going on now, even as we speak, they were not going to reach a peak and turn around the way we wanted to within the time frame that was originally estimated. So I thought it was prudent and, and I think the right decision to extend them another 30 days. Because what you really want to do is you want to start seeing some flattening out and turning around of the curb and it coming down. It wasn't doing that. If you look at New York, it was doing this. If you look at New Orleans, it was doing this. Detroit is certainly going to start doing that. It would not have been a good idea to pull back at a time when you really needed to be pressing your foot on the pedal as opposed to on the brakes. You keep talking about the peak. Can you explain to the American people what exactly <clears throat> that peak looks like and how it will tax the system? Well, there are a number of factors that are going on at the same time. One is the number of new cases per day. The other is the number of deaths that you have. So if you have like 100 cases today, 200 cases tomorrow, 400 cases the next day, 600 cases the next day, you are clearly going in the wrong direction. You don't want to interfere except to try and suppress that. If you reach the point where the number of new cases start to equilibrate so that yesterday you have 150, today you have 150, tomorrow you have 125, they're starting to level off, which is the, is the kind of the beginning of the turning around of the curve of it coming down. Deaths tend to linger a little bit more after the hospitalizations, but when you see the new hospitalizations start to do this, you know you're going in the right direction. And we weren't doing that. And we felt that if we prematurely pulled back, we would only form an acceleration or a rebound of something, which would have put you behind where you were before. And that's the reason why we argued strongly with the president that he not withdraw those guidelines after 15 days, but that he extend them. And he did listen. You argued strongly, you said, with the president. Our reporting is that, among other things, you showed him these models that suggest that even with the current guidelines, the death total in the United States could be between 100,000 and 200,000. So why do you think that was so convincing? Well, it was quite convincing. I mean, the president, his first, as he said multiple times at the press conference yesterday, his first, his first goal is to, pre to prevent suffering and death. Mm. And we made it very clear to him that if we pulled back on what we were doing and didn't extend them, there would be more avoidable suffering and avoidable death. So it was a pretty clear decision on his part. So I just want to take a moment to applaud anyone who is close to Trump that convinced him to not reopen the country by Easter. This is a decision that will literally save lives. So thank you. Trump is easily persuadable. It's usually like the last person who was in his ear before he has to make a decision that will be the most influential. So whoever got to him, you're doing the Lord's work. Thank you. Now, let me just again reiterate that reopening the country too early is idiotic. Like he was expecting a trade-off like we can save the economy if we sacrifice people but that's not necessarily how things work right if you reopen the economy the economy is probably still going to suffer because people dying is bad for the economy there's still going to be global economic ramifications we lived in a highly globalized society world capitalism is currently dominant right so just because the united states chooses to send all of its people back to work to die doesn't mean that other countries are going to do the same thing. That's going to impact trade. That's going to impact global markets. So to just think that you can somehow stop the economy from collapsing if you send people to work to die is idiotic. It's fucking moronic to even think that. So I'm glad that somebody convinced him to not do that. 
Um, with that being said, this crisis is still very real, and Trump is still in charge, ultimately. He's the leader, and he's the worst possible person to be the leader. And it's getting worse. And currently, the United States is the number one country when it comes to COVID cases. The number one country. And I want to share another Dr. Fauci interview where he kind of tells us a little bit of what to expect based on current models and what they project. Well, Dr. Burke said yesterday, as you know, that she doesn't think any city will be spared from this <clears throat> virus. Um, how many cases do you think the U.S. will reach? A million cases? Two, 10 million cases? Or, or, are these, we, or do we not even have any idea? You know, Jake, the honest, to be honest with you, we don't really have any firm idea. There are things called models. And when someone creates a model, they put in various assumptions. And the model is only as good and as accurate as your assumptions. And whenever the model has come in, they give a worst case scenario and a best case scenario. Generally, the reality is somewhere in the middle. I've never seen a model of the diseases that I've dealt with, which the worst case scenario actually came out. They always overshoot. So when you use numbers like a million, a million and a half, two million, that almost certainly is off the chart. Now, it's not impossible, but very, very unlikely. So it's difficult to present. I mean, looking at what we're seeing now, you know, I would say between 100 and 200,000 cases, but I don't want to be held to that because it's, it's, it's uh, excuse me, deaths. I mean, we're, we're going to have millions of cases, but I, I just don't think that we really need to make a projection when it's such a moving target that you can so easily be wrong and mislead people. What we do know, Jake, is that we got a serious mm -hmm. problem in New York, we have a serious problem in New Orleans, and we're gonna be developing serious problems in other areas. So although people like to model it, let's just look at the data of what we have and not worry about these worst case and best case scenarios. So I wanna just stress here that this is speculation, it's based on models. There's really no way of knowing how many people will be affected and ultimately die because of COVID-19. But what Dr. Fauci says here, I mean, I just want you to think a little bit harder about this. He says it's not going to be, you know, one to two million people, most likely. It's possible, right? It's within the realm of possibility, but it's highly unlikely. However, what we're looking at is probably 100,000 to 200,000 people dying. To put that into perspective, on 9-11, we lost 2,977 people, and we are already almost at 3,000 when it comes to the lives we've lost due to COVID-19. So if, you know, these models bear out, not the best case scenario, but not the worst case scenario, and we land somewhere in the middle, which is what Dr. Fauci estimates will be the actual case, it's still going to be one of the biggest crises we've ever had to face. And that's true not just for America, but for the human race. And that's really terrifying. And it doesn't help that we have the worst possible leader at a time when we need someone who's at least semi-competent. Just semi-competent. We see Donald Trump caring more about his own image and perception. He's getting into spats with governors. He is uh, not agreeing with how much ventilators hospitals say they need. He's sending, you know, states broken medical equipment, including ventilators. And on top of that, he's trying to lie to people and mislead them for purposes of doing damage control to make him look less bad. So when it comes to us being the number one country with COVID cases, he said that's because, you know, we just are testing more people, which is factually incorrect. But here's the clip of him saying that. We are uh, testing nearly 100,000 people a day, which is more than any other country in the world. And uh, the reason we have more cases than anybody is because we're finding more people, because we're testing much more. So when the fake news goes and says, well, we have more, the fact is that if you look at other countries, you have countries with 1.5 billion people. Uh, those countries, uh, if they tested everybody, it would be a whole different story. But yeah, that's just not true. Tests are not widely available. There are people who are taking the social media to voice their grievances about how they're experiencing COVID-19-like symptoms, uh, shortness of breath, high fever, and they are not able to get a test. 
doctors are telling them to just stay home, self-quarantine, because there's just not enough tests to go around. If we actually tested everyone who wanted a test or who were experiencing symptoms that needed a test, then the number would be much higher of suspected cases, of confirmed cases, that is. So that's just not true. But look, we don't know how long this is going to last. And that uncertainty is, I think, the most difficult part for people. Because working with incomplete information, it makes crises a lot worse. Like, if we get a sense of a timeline, it's easier for us to mentally grapple with how long we have to hunker down in our homes. But the fact that we don't know, the fact that it's just kind of an open question, it makes it that much worse for people. And I really hope that in the future, we kind of have more measures in place to better prepare ourselves, not just for global pandemics, but any types of crises. And, you know, I don't want to be even a bigger Debbie Downer here, but I don't think that this is going to be the last global pandemic. Climate change will expose us to new diseases as the ice thaws. Uh, but on top of that, it will introduce us to new crises. And even when this crisis is over, we could see a resurgence of COVID-19 after we think it's gone. So we just have to be better prepared. We have to give people the option of seeing a therapist online. But that also means they have to be able to afford it. And not just afford it. They should be able to get it regardless if they can or can't afford it, right? Because affordability is something that is incredibly subjective. So as we enter, you know, this new week... I just hope that people take time for themselves, find a way to treat themselves. If that means being a little bit lazy, lounging around the house, playing Animal Crossing, whatever you can do psychologically for yourself to cope, exercise in your house, do it. Don't feel guilty about it because we have to make sure that we social distance, we quarantine. And um, just uh, from my own experience and anyone I've talked to, who had to leave, who still has to work, people are not taking this shit seriously. They're not taking this seriously. And we need to. There's a lot of people taking this seriously, but not everyone is. So if we all actually abided by what the CDC is recommending, then this would be over faster. That's what people need to realize, but it's impossible to get everyone to do the same thing. Right, We can't force everyone to social distance and self-quarantine. So those of us who are behaving good, we are only as strong. This pandemic will only last as long as our most stubborn citizens and stubborn government officials. So we don't necessarily know when this will be over, but just understand that it will be over at some point in time. This, like all crises, will come to an end at some point. And that's what you have to keep telling yourself, as difficult as it is to imagine, because we're not even in the middle at this point. We're not even to the middle point. But just know, this isn't going to last forever. Things will be different afterwards, but there will be a degree of normalcy, at least in the sense that we can go to the store and not have to worry about... Uh, you know, uh, getting exposed to it, or we can go to the movie theater and not worry about getting exposed. So just try to tell yourself that and do what you need to do. Any psychological crutches that you have, video games, like indulge yourself. If you have food at your house that's unhealthy, eat it. Just try to give yourself a pass during this time because we have to do everything we can to stay sane because it's tough currently. I know. Some Amazon warehouse workers in New York and Instacart workers nationwide have announced on Monday that they are going on strike because since they're considered essential during this global pandemic, well, their health and well-being should also be considered essential. But they are saying that their employers aren't taking their concerns about coronavirus seriously. Hence, they're striking until their demands are met.
So for more on this story, we go to Alina Salika and Shannon Bond of NPR who report some Amazon warehouse workers in Staten Island, New York and Instacart's grocery delivery workers nationwide walked off their jobs on Monday. They're demanding stepped up protection and pay as they continue to work while much of the country is asked to isolate as a safeguard against the coronavirus. The protests come as Amazon and Instacart have said they plan to hire tens of thousands of new workers. Online shopping and grocery home delivery are skyrocketing as much of the nation hunkers down and people stay at home following recommendations from federal and local governments. This has put a spotlight on workers who shop, pack, and deliver these high-demand supplies. Companies refer to the workers as heroes, but workers say their employers aren't doing enough to keep them safe. The workers are asking for a variety of changes. Workers from both Amazon and Instacart want more access to paid sick time off. At this time, it's available only to those who have tested positive for the coronavirus or get placed on mandatory self-quarantine. Amazon workers want their warehouse to be closed for a longer cleaning with guaranteed pay. Instacart's grocery delivery gig workers are asking for disinfected wipes and hand sanitizer and better pay to offset the risk they are taking. Workers at Amazon's Staten Island facility have said that multiple people at the warehouse have been diagnosed with COVID-19. Some of them plan to walk off the job on Monday to pressure the company to close the warehouse for an extended deep cleaning. At Amazon, which employs some 800,000 people, workers have diagnosed positively for COVID-19 in at least 11 warehouses, forcing a prolonged closure of at least one warehouse in Kentucky. Now, what they're asking for, I think, is perfectly reasonable. So these demands shouldn't be very difficult for these companies to meet. And I would encourage all of you to not cross the picket line. Do not shop at these companies as they uh, as they uh, have these negotiations. And, you know, we have to show solidarity with the workers. These are things that should not have to be asked for. They should just be automatically provided to workers. But the fact that we have Amazon, a company where they're literally asking employees to donate their sick time to people with COVID-19 rather than just offering extended paid sick leave to everyone. It's just, we shouldn't have this happening. Now, of course, we need to have federal protections codified into law, but the mere fact that workers have to ask for these things, hand sanitizer, extra paid sick leave during a global pandemic, it shows you the priorities of corporate America. They don't care about their workers. To them, their workers are easily replaceable, right? It doesn't really matter if they get sick or they die even. They see them as just cogs in a machine that they can easily replace with someone else who's desperate. Lots of people are losing their jobs, so likely, you know, they're going to turn to these types of jobs in the gig economy, right? Uber Eats, uh, Instacart. So right now, they probably don't really feel like they have to pay attention to their workers because they're not going to do it just out of the goodness of their heart. But if we all choose to not shop at these uh, outlets, use these services until they meet the demands, maybe they'll actually take their employees seriously. Now, I do want to share a video of the protests and um, just let you see what they have to say. At least one Amazon worker has to say. I think that this is perfectly reasonable. My name is Heaven, and I walked out because Amazon lied. They told me there was one case in the building, and it's actually 11, so I don't feel safe. I mean, who hears her and thinks, how unreasonable is she being? Why should these workers put their lives on the line for an employer who doesn't respect them? Why should they do that? The answer is they shouldn't do that. They shouldn't do that. And, you know, finally, as someone who formerly worked in fast food and retail, it's nice to see people finally pay lip service to us and say, you know, hey, we really appreciate you, you know, braving the storm, so to speak, and working during this crisis. Um, well, if you believe in that, then definitely support workers' rights. Support increases in the minimum wage. The same people who basically denounce a $15 an hour minimum wage are the same people, like Tommy Laren, for example, who are talking about how heroic the grocery store cashiers are. All right, well, if you believe that, then actually acknowledge their full humanity. Acknowledge that they deserve paid sick leave, a livable wage, 
vacation time. That's paid, where you don't just take it off and have to save money, uh, not just for the vacation, but extra money to cover the bills. In most instances, you just don't get a vacation. But I mean, it's time that we acknowledge how valuable all of these workers are, not just during a global pandemic, but just all the time. All the time. If you are a fast food worker, you deserve a livable wage. If you work for an Amazon warehouse, you shouldn't be forced to uh, piss in bottles to make sure that you meet your strict delivery guidelines. I shouldn't even have to say that, right? So I really hope that these demands are met, but if they are not, we all should not cross the picket line. Do not support these companies if they are not going to support their employees because if they know that this protest isn't going to affect their bottom line if they know that customers are still going to shop there and not pay attention they're going to replace all these workers and just hire other people because there's lots of people looking for work currently because they're losing their jobs because of this pandemic and in these industries and amazon and instacart and uber eats they're going to be booming currently these delivery services so they can't you know capitalize on this crisis by just, you know, uh, treating their workers like garbage. They have to acknowledge that we see as consumers what they do and how they treat their workers. And we w will respond accordingly if they don't choose to value their employers. So I hope that this is effective and I hope that they get all that they want and more because they deserve it. Everyone deserves this. So last week, we learned that Bernie Sanders will be staying in the race for the foreseeable future. In fact, he intends on debating Joe Biden if he uh, isn't a coward and actually chooses to debate Bernie Sanders. But predictably, Democrats, specifically the Democratic Party establishment, they're not too happy with Bernie Sanders' decision because they want him to drop out immediately so that way we can wrap this thing up and coronate Joe Biden. And because that's not happening, well, they are having a meltdown. And this article from the Washington Post explains the situation i think really well and let me just tell you their tears are delicious quote behind the growing fear among many democrats that senator bernie sanders continued presence in the presidential race could spell doom in november is the belief that they've seen it happen before in the last campaign although sanders has long pledged to do all he can to help the eventual nominee defeat president trump democrats are still haunted by the last grueling battle which didn't end after it became clear that clinton would be the nominee and instead Instead, stretched into the summer convention and beyond. Then, as now, an impassioned band of Sanders supporters voiced their displeasure loudly and widely, sometimes echoing the harshest attacks of Trump and his allies with little reproach from Sanders. So we're just like the MAGA chuds, according to them. Moved by an urgency to come together against Trump as the coronavirus pandemic has upended the presidential race, some party leaders feel that Sanders should end his campaign and help the Democratic Party position itself for the November general election quote i just think it's a terrible decision for him to make because he looks very selfish said former democratic senator barbara boxer of california who backs biden if sanders is genuine about going all in to defeat trump then get out she said although sanders personally is not waging a scorched earth campaign against biden some of his most visible supporters continue to rail against the former vice president's policy ideas and question his cognitive abilities a trend that worries party leaders senior Democrats have expressed concern in recent days that Sanders is once again obliquely giving his supporters permission to continue to question Biden's fitness as the Democratic nominee. There is growing anticipation for him to start to help, said one senior Democratic strategist who spoke on the condition of anonymity to speak more frankly about the concerns. For his movement to be successful, he needs to find the right way to land the plane at the Joe Biden International Airport. Among the moderates, there remains a frustration that the Sanders forces demand that the winning primary candidates conform to his views and not the other way around. They suggest the situation is even more dire this year than in 2016, given the party's antipathy toward Trump. So a couple of things stand out to me. The first is that they are very clearly, uh, explicitly, <laughs> blaming Bernie Sanders and his supporters for Hillary Clinton's loss in 2016. Let me remind you, she didn't set foot in Wisconsin but Bernie's to blame. So they're saying, well, look, you already helped Hillary Clinton lose in 2016, so do you really want that to happen again? Now, the second thing is that they want him to drop out, because if he doesn't, then he's being selfish. Uh, there was a quote from a former Clinton aide who said, look, we shouldn't pretend like Bernie cares about anything but himself. 
I'm paraphrasing, but that was the sentiment. Now, again, I want to stress to you that before Joe Biden became the front runner pre Super Tuesday, we were looking at a situation where if Bernie Sanders ended up with a plurality of pledged delegates, even if you know he had a strong plurality, if he didn't get that 50 plus 1% majority, well, Democrats would try to opt for a contested convention and steal it away from Bernie. Even Joe Biden said if he, uh, if Bernie gets plurality, he's opting for a contested convention. Elizabeth Warren said the same thing. All Democrats said, look, I know what I've said about wanting to beat Donald Trump, but if Bernie doesn't get a majority, we're going to try to steal it from him. But it's funny because now that the shoe is on the other foot, they're not really saying that. Uh, they're screaming, Bernie, what are you doing? Get out. Do you not see that Donald Trump is the president and we need to defeat him? Well, where was that energy a couple of weeks ago before Super Tuesday? When uh, Bernie was looking like the eventual nominee and all of the Democrats, except for him, claimed that they would try to get superdelegates to steal it away from Bernie at the convention. Where was that energy then? Where was the urgency to defeat Donald Trump back then when it looked like Bernie Sanders was going to be the nominee? It's funny how quickly they move the goalpost, right? All of a sudden, defeating Donald Trump is really important. It's priority number one. It wasn't before Super Tuesday, but now it really is. And, you know, staying in the race is the worst thing that Bernie can possibly do. Imagine if Bernie actually said, no, I'm going to opt for a contested convention and try to get superdelegates to steal it away from Joe Biden and give it to me. Imagine if he said that. There would be like shrieks from all the Democratic Party establishment members nonstop, right? But he's very politely opting to stay in the race and not even go negative against Joe Biden. And they're still losing it. These people are hypocrites and they stand for absolutely nothing. And it's interesting to me how they are shamelessly suggesting that, you know, getting Bernie supporters to back Biden, it's not Biden's responsibility. Actually, it is Bernie's responsibility. A former Obama advisor actually said this pretty explicitly in response to a tweet from ABC News, which says that 15% of Bernie Sanders supporters would back Trump over Biden. Well, this is what Ben LeBolt had to say. This is a huge problem and something Bernie Sanders needs to work on every day from now until November. He is responsible for the outcome with this segment of voters, and his effort to persuade them to support Joe Biden should start today. So it's not Joe Biden's responsibility to win over Bernie Sanders supporters. It is solely Bernie Sanders' responsibility to get his supporters to back Biden, in spite of zero concessions being made at this point in time. Like, do you see how ridiculous this is? I feel like the only people who can see how hypocritical the Democratic Party establishment is are progressives. Like, nobody else can see it. Centrists don't care at all that every other contender wanted to steal the nomination away from Bernie Sanders just a couple of weeks ago. But all of a sudden, now that the race is down to two people, just the fact that Bernie Sanders is in the race is heresy. They have a different set of standards that apply to you, that apply to Bernie Sanders and progressives, that they don't apply to themselves. And this shouldn't surprise anyone. If you've been following Democratic Party politics and intra-party warfare, their goal is to crush the left. They don't want to win over the left. They'd rather lose than actually adopt any of the policies offered by the left. Their goal is to silence the left and uh, get them to acquiesce. But adopting their policies to get their votes, not going to happen. They're not interested in that. They would rather lose to Donald Trump because, again, they have no reason to support Joe Biden over Donald Trump. Think about this. If you are just a member of the House of Representatives in the Democratic Party, how does having Donald Trump as president affect you more than a Joe Biden presidency? Well, in some ways, it's better. It might be worse for the country, but you can fundraise off of Donald Trump. That's been a really lucrative strategy for Democrats. On top of that, you don't have to do jack shit. You don't have to piss off the base by actually proposing, you know, policies like or shooting down policies like Medicare for all. You can just pass a bunch of policies and say, we really tried to pass them, but our hands are tied because uh, Mitch McConnell 
won't let us vote on them. Like you can you can do all of that. There's a lot of excuses if Trump is president. But if Biden is president, all those excuses kind of just go away. And now you kind of have to put up, right? You kind of have to put up or shut up. And it's easier for them to kind of just sit on their asses for another four more years, watch the country go to shit, and fundraise off of uh, Donald Trump. The situation is really grim. And the fact that we are forced to share a party with Democrats, it shouldn't happen. The left should have their own party and corporate Democrats should have to share a party with Republicans because they are more ideologically aligned. The only thing in theory that progressives agree with the center on are social issues, but Democrats don't even care about that. They've proven they couldn't care less about that. I mean, when it comes to this Me Too issue, which is hugely significant, what have Democrats done? After crying about Brett Kavanaugh and Dr. Christine Blasey Ford's allegations, they're silent when it comes to Joe Biden. So anything that they claimed to believe in, they don't in actuality. It's lip service. Because if they abandon, you know, their support for social issues, then they have nothing to pitch to the left. They can't say, well, at least we're better on trans issues. At least we're going to look out for marginalized people a little bit more. But when push comes to shove, they never, ever deliver. So, I mean... I don't even know what to say anymore. This isn't surprising, but the Democratic Party is going to do the same exact thing they did in 2016. And mark my words, if they lose to Donald Trump, they're not going to have any introspection whatsoever. They're not going to have a single autopsy. They're not going to try to change their tactics to win because so long as the left is, you know, powerless and silenced, that is is what they care the most about. Because then they can continue to be an opposition party, but not offend their corporate donors. But the minute they actually do take power and they've got to deliver, well, um, that's an issue. Because uh, they're going to piss off their corporate donors if they do anything that the left wants, like Medicare for All. So the situation we are in is uh, incredibly frustrating. And left-wing parties all over the place have failed. Uh, supposedly left-wing parties all over the place, all over the world, have uh, failed the countries. That's why you see the rise of these right-wing demagogues in places like India, Turkey, Brazil. It's because the left loses a leader. The left ends up um, having to acquiesce and join centrists, and it just it never works out. You know, dissatisfaction with the establishment has led to the resurgence of fascism. And if Democrats were serious about defeating Donald Trump, then they would take the left seriously. But because they're not, then whenever they fearmonger about Donald Trump, you know, their fears are valid. We should fear Donald Trump. But I don't believe that they fear Donald Trump. I think they're trying to get you scared so you support them no matter what. But I don't buy anything that they say. These people are full of shit. And they're not your allies. They're your enemy. So with Joe Biden being the Democratic Party's frontrunner, you would think that currently if he genuinely wanted to win, he would be doing everything in his power to win over Bernie Sanders supporters. Now, one thing that he could do that might help is endorse Medicare for All. I say might because none of us would believe that he actually believed in it. But if he at least endorsed the idea of Medicare for All, it would give Bernie Sanders supporters just a little indication that maybe he's serious about winning us over, but he's not willing to do that. But putting politics aside, let's say he didn't want to embrace Medicare for all for purposes of political expediency. He should at least reconsider his current position out of necessity, given the global pandemic that we are dealing with, because before this pandemic hit, he claimed that he would veto Medicare for all. Okay, that's horrible. You're a bad person because 68,000 lives would be saved, according to a Yale study, every single year if we passed Medicare for All. But if you actually cared about the people, this global pandemic, if nothing else, should get you to rethink your position. Now, the way that COVID-19 is going to have a very direct impact on our lives isn't just through, you know, social distancing and self-quarantining. It's going to be on healthcare costs to where even if you're one of the lucky ones who don't get COVID-19 or know anyone, this still may affect you because health insurance companies are going to raise the costs because that's the only way that they're going to be able to recoup what they've lost 
fighting this pandemic. And this headline from the New York Times explains it well. Coronavirus may add billions to the nation's health care bill. Insurance premiums could spike as much as 40% next year, a new analysis warns, as employers and insurers confront the projected tens of billions of dollars in additional costs of treating coronavirus patients. So I want you to think about that before we go into the article. Insurance premiums could jump to as high as 40%. So even if you personally don't get COVID-19, people who are on the same health insurance plan that you're on will. And this is going to cost the insurance companies millions of dollars to pay for the treatment and whatnot. So, you know, the costs are going to go up because they're not just going to eat that loss. These are businesses. Remember, their number one goal is to make money, not provide people with health care. So they're going to pass that cost on to the consumer rather than just eating it themselves, not taking an extra bonus. And it really shows why private insurance companies should not exist. We should abolish them and opt for single payer at a minimum, a national health system at a maximum. But let's get to the story because I think it's very telling about the current situation. Reed Abelson reports, with so much still uncertain about how widespread hospitalizations for coronavirus patients will be around the United States, a new analysis says premiums could increase as much as 40% next year if the pandemic results in millions of Americans needing hospital stays. Health plans went into 2020 with no hint of coronavirus virus on the horizon, said Peter V. Lee, the executive director of Covered California, the state insurance marketplace created under the Affordable Care Act, which conducted the analysis. To protect businesses and individuals from sharply higher rates, he supports a temporary federal program that would cover some of these costs. No insurer, no state planned, and put money away for something of this significance, Mr. Lee said. Insurers and employers are already prodding Congress to consider health helping them pay for a crisis by setting up a special reinsurance program that would cover the most expensive medical claims. The federal government would fund the program to lower the amount being paid by employers and insurers. While insurers have enjoyed strong profits in recent years, they say the cost of the pandemic could be overwhelming, especially to employers and workers already struggling to pay for coverage. Without help lowering their costs by having government pay for the most expensive hospital stays, Mr. Lee warned that insurers are likely to seek rates that are double their additional costs from the virus. Their costs go up 20%, Mr. Lee says. Rates could jump as much as 40% in 2021. So just pause and really think about this. Think about how disgusting this is. We are told to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We're told that, you know, if we have an emergency that we can't afford, maybe we should have saved that money. Maybe we shouldn't have bought that new iPhone. Maybe we shouldn't be buying coffees. Maybe we should, you know, save that money for a rainy day. Well, why isn't the government telling the CEOs and CFOs and COOs of these companies, hey, rather than pocketing the profits that you made, why didn't you guys save for a global pandemic? Why didn't you put away money for a situation like this? Why is the first thing that you're doing is crying to the government for help, begging For corporate socialism, that's unacceptable. And really what's hilarious to me is after spending four years trying to convince us how much we love our employer-based private health insurance plans, well, they're really not doing a good job of making the case for themselves in favor of their existence. They're making the case against themselves because if you can't weather this storm, so to speak, during a global pandemic, then why should we have private insurance companies? Maybe the government should be the sole insurer of Americans. Maybe the government should be the single payer if these private companies are going to beg the government for help anyways. Why should we put more money into a private system when the government can just offer socialized insurance to Americans? And that's at a minimum. I'm getting to the point where Medicare for all just isn't enough. I want a national health system because these private insurance companies, private hospitals... Maybe they can't deal with a global pandemic sufficiently. Maybe we need a full-on Great Britain model, right? So they're not helping to make the case for their existence. But seeing what's playing out, seeing the need for healthcare during a global pandemic and seeing how this may impact individual human beings in this country, 
you think that that would trigger at least some level of introspection and at least maybe make Joe Biden rethink for a second his previous anti-Medicare for all stance. But he's not doing that. Asked about this in an interview, whether or not, you know, he would consider softening his stance towards Medicare for all, he unequivocally said, nope, not going to do it. Take a look. I do have one final question for you, because as you've been seeing, our health care system seems to be crumbling underneath this crisis. There is not enough. There's not enough support for the health care system. There's not enough support for the American people inside of the health care system. Are you now reconsidering your position when it comes to single payer health care? Single payer will not solve that at all. The thing that is needed is, for example, we have a whole number of hospitals that are being so stretched, including rural hospitals, they're going to need more financing. That doesn't come from a single payer system. That comes from the federal government stepping up and dealing with the concerns that they have, the reimbursement that they're going to get, how they're going to be able to move forward and how they're going to be able to make provide all the needed help that are needed in their communities. This is an opportunity to look at reconstructing the health care system in a way that, in fact, can respond more rapidly and more and more and more effectively to these kinds of crises, because it's going to come again. We should be spending and we are spending a great deal of time and effort finding a vaccine, finding a way to, that we can deal with preventing these diseases further down the road. But, for example, we had people when our administration, we had CDC people in other countries because we wanted to anticipate when, in fact, another virus would occur, when, in fact, a pandemic might occur as a consequence of a spreading virus in another country to act quickly. President, we withdrew those people. I insisted that we I, I did insist. I, I suggested that we should have people in China at the outset of this event. And when it all started in Luhan province and what happened, we did not insist that they go into so, the areas we wanted to. So, so I, I just that's all I can do is do what I know has to be done. Say what I know has to be done. OK, well, then fuck you. No Medicare for all. No vote. Fuck you. It's that simple. If you won't even consider it, then I won't even consider voting for you. Now, it's not like Joe Biden would be let off his leash by his health industry donors, because once he entered this race, we all know that the health insurance industry was betting on him to save their asses. So he's doing this for self-interested reasons. He wouldn't dare support Medicare for all because his donors in the health insurance industry wouldn't be too happy about that. And maybe they wouldn't support his campaign as willingly as they are now. Now, I just want to note that in that entire interview, not once was he asked about Tara Reid's allegations of sexual assault. So just keep that in mind. Now, you know, what's interesting about this is the way he answered that question, like first he said no, and then he said that single pair wouldn't help. And then he went on to uh, do word salad and just change the subject, basically. He started talking about vaccines and the CDC and whatnot. And the reason why he can't actually give a cogent answer to that question, aside from the fact that he is obviously in cognitive decline, is because there is no serious answer that you can give to that. This global pandemic, COVID-19, has proven why we need Medicare for all. And in every single state so far that has voted in this primary process, even in states where Joe Biden won in a landslide, still a majority of voters opted for Medicare for all. So the fact that he won't even consider it, consider this one concession, it shows you where his priorities lie. He doesn't care about the American people, or at a minimum, he cares less about them than the profits of health insurance companies. Maybe he cares about the American people. Maybe he genuinely doesn't want people to die, but he doesn't care enough to opt for a Medicare for all system. Now, what's funny is that he still wants to pretend as if he's the hero. He tweeted out, let me be clear, no one should have to pay for coronavirus testing or treatment, to which Astra Taylor responded saying, then why should they have to pay for chemo? Exactly. If you think it's unreasonable to make people pay for treatment for something that's out of their control, that they would choose not to get, why can't we extend that logic to other sicknesses? Why are we suddenly making an exception 
for COVID-19. Kamala Harris tweeted the same thing. I thought she supported Medicare for all at one point in time. What a big joke that turned out to be. But why is it that you think they should pay for chemo, but they shouldn't pay for coronavirus? Now, of course, I don't believe that anyone should have to pay for treatment for COVID-19, but they also shouldn't have to pay for anything. Healthcare should be free at the point of service because if you don't have a dime to your name, that doesn't mean that you should be denied access to health care. And I'm not talking access to health insurance. I'm talking direct access to health care itself. So, I mean, the state of American politics is just disgusting. We can literally be hit with a global pandemic and now be the number one country in the world with COVID-19 cases. And the Democratic Party, the supposedly left-wing party, the party of the working class, still won't even consider for a second Medicare for all. And Democrats wonder why there's so little enthusiasm for Joe Biden. And I'm sure that they're going to wonder why he lost to Donald Trump if that does, in fact, happen in November. But if they want to know and they seriously want to know why they're so hated by everyone, they need to look in the mirror because they've lost their souls. They used to be the party of FDR and now they are the party of, um, I don't know what they stand for, to be honest. They don't stand for working people. So um, this party is uh, a disgrace. Joe Biden is a terrible candidate. And out of a field of, uh, what, 20 plus candidates, we really shouldn't allow it to be lost on us that Democrats opted for one of the worst. One of the worst. The only person who would have been worse than Joe Biden is Michael Bloomberg. But the fact that they opted for the second worst, I mean, <laughs> what a joke. So last week, Ryan Grimm and Katie Halper broke Tara Reid's Me Too story, and she alleges that when she worked for Joe Biden back in the 90s, he sexually assaulted her. Now, we don't necessarily know whether or not these claims are valid. If you listen to Tara Reid's story, I mean, you can make that decision on your own. I certainly believe her. But what's interesting is that the media has taken very little interest in this story. In fact, there's almost been a complete blackout aside from a few sources covering this story. The Huffington Post, to their credit, talked about this story. Vox covered this story. And Yahoo News temporarily covered this story as well before eventually moving it over to their sports section. And then uh, the link broke and now it's just not available. Definitely not weird. Nothing to see here, folks. Now, um, when it comes to cable news... We've seen basically complete silence. CNN and MSNBC, both extensions of the Democratic Party, by and large, haven't talked about this. Surprise, surprise. Now, it's interesting because they tried to make us believe that they actually cared about the Me Too and Time's Up movements and that women maybe should be able to come out, share their stories, and not be silenced when men in powerful positions sexually assault and or sexually harass them, but they haven't said a word. Now, when they cover the Brett Kavanaugh and Dr. Christine Blasey Ford story, they covered it a lot. There was wall-to-wall -wall coverage, and I think that them covering that a lot was warranted because if you are auditioning for a job in a very powerful position and you're going to be dictating judicial precedent for uh, or legal precedent for years to come then, I mean, I think that the American people have a right to know at a minimum. So give us the details. Let us at least decide on our own. You just have to lay it out for us. And that's it. But the media isn't doing that. Now, the media isn't too surprising. But what's interesting is the way that Joe Biden's campaign is responding to this. And by and large, they're just trying to pretend like this isn't happening. They're trying to bury their heads in the sand and the way that they're doing this is just embarrassingly pathetic. So Simone Sanders, for example, Biden's press spokesperson, she had a lot to say about the Christine Blasey Ford testimony. Um, so much so that she tweeted about it almost nonstop. She went on CNN to talk about it. And suddenly she deleted all of her tweets where she talked about men in power abusing women and how she believed Christine Blasey Ford. So let me share some of what she said. And this is now deleted. Just keep that in mind. 
She wrote, it's demoralizing to watch the patriarchy in America continue to silence the voices of so many, but the patriarchy's day is coming. We will not go silently into the night. Brett Kavanaugh is not out of the woods yet. His nomination can still be stopped. But regardless of what happens this weekend, if your stance is on the side of justice, of truth, we cannot stop fighting. This seems applicable to Joe Biden now. Today, Senate Republicans on the Judiciary Committee seemingly forgot Dr. Ford's testimony. They seemingly forgot the lack of documents and seemingly forgot that Brett Kavanaugh was interviewing for a job, a promotion that he is not entitled to have also applicable to Biden. After her powerful testimony, we heard from Kavanaugh. As he sat before the Senate Judiciary Committee, he oozed with privilege and looked like a man who had never been met with a challenge. He exuded partisan talking points and refused to call for an investigation to clear his name. Hmm, I wonder if Joe Biden's going to call for an investigation and if she'll recommend that. Dr. Ford's courage was powerful. It was infectious and courageous. Prior to her testimony, her courage inspired me to tell my own story of a college rape. Unfortunately, many Senate Republicans just seem to not care. I mean, these were the people that stand and stood by Trump. And there's more, but we'll stop there because you get the point. She was so moved by Dr. Christine Blasey Ford's testimony that she told her own story. And now, all of this, gone, like that. She deleted them. Deleted these tweets because all of a sudden, I guess that what she said no longer stands like i'm trying to figure out what's going on here like if you have a stand nothing should convince you to change that stand remain principled i don't care what job it is i don't care if this will impact your career down the line if you truly believe in something then no matter what the consequences are you should hold true to that belief but like the coward and sellout that she is simone sanders chose to delete all of these tweets. Why? I mean, it's obvious, right? Because it makes her look like a hypocrite. Everything that she said about Brett Kavanaugh can be applied to Joe Biden in this instance with Tara Reid. And she knows that. And she doesn't want to jeopardize her opportunity to be the White House press secretary for Joe Biden. She wants a job. She wants a future in politics. So she knows sometimes, you know, um, you've got to Roll over on your principles and bite the bullet all to make sure that uh, people in power don't get hurt by these types of claims. This is exactly why the Me Too movement came to fruition, right? Was it not so that way women felt like they had the right to come out and share these allegations against men who were previously thought to be untouchable, men with wealth? In positions of power like what was all the point of that what was the point of the me too movement if some of the loudest cheerleaders of this movement all of a sudden are brushing everything they set aside and making an exception for joe biden what was the point of all of that it's just it's sad it's really sad because think of the message that this sends to victims of sexual assault and rape you know what, your voice matters unless you come out against someone and your claim is kind of inconvenient for us because we're trying to win an election. It's embarrassing. Now, I want to share this clip from Simone Sanders on CNN. I believe she was still a CNN contributor at this time before she worked for Biden. Listen to what she said about Dr. Christine Blasey Ford and Brett Kavanaugh. I don't care, it's been 20 years, 50 years, I would come forward because I don't think anyone that has ever done that, whether it was once in their life or 50 times, deserves to sit at the highest precedence I could, of power. I totally agree with that, so that, but you have no I knowledge whether Brett Kavanaugh did that It doesn't matter. I believe Christine just, Ford because the, no, because when you, to come forward, she has no, um, there's no enticements for her to come forward and to have her life destroyed, to have folks sit on panels such as these and even others and have the, the Senate, the leader in the Senate, uh, basically tear down her character and assert that she's a liar. So there's no incentive for her to come forward except to tell the truth. So why doesn't any of what you said about Brett Kavanaugh and Christine Blasey Ford apply to Joe Biden and Tara Reid? Explain that for me, Simone Sanders. Let's go through what she said. Quote, I don't think anyone who's ever done that, whether it's been once in their life or 50 times, deserves to sit at the highest precipice of power. Apparently, you don't believe that anymore. Quote, I believe Christine Ford because to come forward, 
There's no enticement for her to come forward and to have her life destroyed. There's no incentives for her to come forward except to tell the truth. Are you going to extend that same logic to Tara Reid? I just, these people are such frauds. They will believe passionately in what they believed in until the minute it becomes inconvenient and then they will abandon those beliefs for purposes of political expediency. And it's just, it's sad, it's pathetic. Look, hypothetically speaking, in the event this type of accusation was lodged against Bernie Sanders, I have no doubt that the media would cover this nonstop. But as a Bernie Sanders supporter, how would I handle this? Well, first of all, I would expect Bernie Sanders to be responsible and call for an independent investigation, call for the FBI to investigate these claims, hear out the accuser, and potentially abandon my support for Bernie Sanders, which I admit would be difficult because I believe in policy, but just based on principle and morality, basic morality, I couldn't support someone even if ideologically they agreed with me if I believed that they did something like that. Now, maybe Simone Sanders doesn't believe Tara Reid. Maybe she just believes that Joe Biden is innocent. Okay, well then explain your logic, ex explain your reasoning, and tell us your side of the story. But instead, she's choosing to be a coward and hide from all of this and delete what she said about Brett Kavanaugh and Christine Blasey Ford so she doesn't look like a hypocrite. Well, guess what? Too late. Once you put it up on the internet, it is there forever. It's there forever. So, I mean, this shouldn't surprise anyone to see that Democrats are complete frauds and they're hypocrites. But, you know, just the depths of their hypocrisy and how quickly they're willing to abandon what they claimed to stand for. It's just pathetic. I don't know what else to say. It's just downright pathetic. The Democratic Party establishment has been conspicuously silent in the face of very serious allegations against Joe Biden. However, one finally decided to speak up. But what this individual decided to say um, isn't too surprising. Uh, it was Howard Dean, and he decided to, rather than actually responding to these claims, shoot the messenger, as they say. He tweeted, This story may or may not be true, but it's from The Intercept, which one, is often not credible, two, was started by Glenn Greenwald, who helped Assange and Putin undermine the 2016 election. I tend to believe victims, but skeptical about sources like this. They are the fox of the left. Now, first of all, how is The Intercept not credible? How are they less credible than sources that you support? that are either owned by billionaire oligarchs or by large multi-billion dollar corporations. MSNBC is owned by Comcast. The Washington Post is owned by Jeff Bezos. The Intercept was started by an investigative journalist, Glenn Greenwald. Now, I know you don't like Glenn Greenwald, but it's Ryan Grimm who reported on this story and Katie Halper who interviewed Tara Reid. So what about The Intercept do you not like? Like, you can't just throw out a claim like that and try to discredit this organization without explaining specifically why you don't like them. But you see, the thing about Howard Dean is he is a hack. He is currently a lobbyist. He used to be progressive, but now he's a lobbyist. And anytime he has an opportunity to undermine the left, he does it. And it doesn't matter what he said or what the Democratic Party establishment said about Brett Kavanaugh and Christine Blasey Ford. What matters is that their team wins always. So if their team is in a position where it may not look good for their particular players, then they're going to lie, smear, slander, invoke Russian conspiracy theories and how Glenn Greenwald assisted Assange and Russia. I don't even know what that means. I think what he means by that is that The Intercept published articles talking about uh, the WikiLeaks revelations that the DNC rigged the primary against Bernie Sanders that allegedly came from Russia. I don't know what he means by that, but all I know is that this is pathetic. This is sad. The same thing was said about Tara Reid. She was accused of being a Russian asset when she initially accused Joe Biden of sexual assault, which is why she chose to go back into silence. So Democrats don't really have anything left but to trot out Russia, discredit, you know, the organizations that are reporting on stories that they don't like, shoot the messenger, if you will. But it shows you how pathetic they are. It shows you how they stand for absolutely nothing. They have zero integrity. Now, 
It's sad that I have to criticize Howard Dean because at least he acknowledged the existence of Tara Reid and this story. He at least did that, the bare minimum, right? But everyone else in the Democratic Party establishment has remained silent. Joe Biden has been on MSNBC and CNN multiple times since, the, since this story broke, and the number of times he's been asked about Tara Reid, zero. So the mere fact that Howard Dean is even acknowledging the story, I think, is a win in and of itself. But of course, the way that he's responding is predictably uh, pathetic and disgusting. So Howard Dean is a spineless coward. He is the biggest shill. I think he is the perfect representative of the corporate democratic wing of the party. And, you know, it doesn't matter what they said about Dr. Christine Blasey Ford and Brett Kavanaugh. What matters, as I said, is that their team wins at all costs. It doesn't matter if you look, you know, like you have no integrity and uh, they don't care about that. But, you know, as much as they want to hide this story away, the minute that the Democratic Party primaries are officially over, I guarantee you Republicans will make this the number one story in America. And they are a lot more disciplined than Democrats are in messaging. So whatever they want the narrative to be, that's what it's going to be. And they're going to try to get revenge on Democrats who they believe wrongly accused Brett Kavanaugh. But as someone who dislikes Brett Kavanaugh, Donald Trump, and Joe Biden, and the Democratic Party establishment, I can tell you, they're all hypocrites. They're all opportunists who are all, you know, in politics for self-serving reasons. And none of them give a damn about women because they're not consistent, right? Being consistent and actually remaining principled means that sometimes you have to abandon people who are doing things that are contrary to what they say they believe in, right? So yes, you think that Joe Biden has stood up for women throughout his, his career. Uh, I disagree with that. But now you have a very serious allegation, something that the left claimed for years now with the Me Too movement that we should take seriously. We should vet these claims. Joe Biden should call for an investigation, but the fact that that's not happening, it shows you how fake and phony the Democratic Party is. They stand for nothing. They stand for absolutely nothing. And if this doesn't prove that to you, then absolutely nothing will. A new poll conducted by ABC News and The Washington Post has some not so great news for Joe Biden. So even though overall he's polling ahead of Donald Trump, albeit marginally, the enthusiasm deficit that he's had throughout the Democratic primary hasn't gotten any better. Now, when you look at levels of enthusiasm in the general election, well, 85% of Trump supporters overall are either very or somewhat enthusiastic, while 73% of Biden supporters are very or somewhat enthusiastic. Translation, Trump supporters are far more enthusiastic than Joe Biden supporters overall. Now, when you look at those who are very enthusiastic, 53% of Donald Trump supporters are very enthusiastic, while only 24% of Joe Biden supporters are very enthusiastic. That is a 29-point difference. 29 points. That's a lot. Now, enthusiasm doesn't necessarily translate into votes, and there are a lot of external factors that can currently influence the outcome of the 2020 election in November. Currently, you know, we don't we don't know how this COVID-19 pandemic is going to play out. We don't know how this will impact the economy and how much of a blame Donald Trump will take, at least how much voters will blame him for this and how he handles it. We, we just don't know. So there's a lot of external factors. But currently, as it stands now, this poll is very bad news for Joe Biden, because what does this indicate to us? If there's a lack of enthusiasm in a general election, turnout is low. Now, riddle me this, when turnout is low, who's more likely to benefit from that, Democrats or Republicans? Republicans. Because the same loyal Republicans who vote every two years are going to come out again and loyally support Donald Trump. But Democrats win when they get out the vote, when they register new voters and expand the base, attract independents, go after non-voters. But if you have a nominee at the top of your ticket who's not able to do that, that is a very bad sign. That's an indicator of what's to come. 
another four years of Donald Trump. Now ABC News puts these numbers into context for us. Perhaps the Democrats' biggest risk is under the surface, in Trump's big advantage in backers who are very enthusiastic about supporting him. Strong enthusiasm for a candidate can help boost turnout on election day, a must-have particularly for Democrats, who rely more on motivating less frequent voters to come to the polls. There's deja vu in these results. Former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton found herself in largely the same position four years ago. She, too, had a slim lead among Democrats for the nomination and ran essentially evenly with Trump among registered voters. And and she lagged in enthusiasm with a low of 32%, very enthusiastic, in September 2016. Biden is eight points under that mark now. Bad as Biden's enthusiasm score is, we've seen worse. As few as 17% of former Republican presidential nominee and Arizona Senator John McCain supporters were very enthusiastic about his candidacy in 2008, and former Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney saw 23% in 2012. The poor omen for Biden is that Clinton, McCain, and Romney all lost. And the fact that Joe Biden is eight points behind where Hillary Clinton was... And she lost to Donald Trump? Biden's probably going to lose. I'm just going to say that. Biden is probably going to lose. That's not a foregone conclusion. But if you nominate Joe Biden, you get Donald Trump for another four years. Now, if Joe Biden loses... Uh, the left will be blamed. They'll say that, you know, not enough Bernie Sanders supporters fell in line and supported the nominee. But we've been telling you since last year, the beginning of last year, that Joe Biden is not electable. And what did they say? Oh, well, you have to vote for Joe Biden because he's the most electable. Jill Biden, Joe Biden's wife said, look, I know that you don't like my husband's shitty health care policy. I'm paraphrasing. But you should probably just suck it up and vote for him anyway, because he's the one who's most electable. Now, this all sounds eerily familiar to what was said back in 2016. We were told that Hillary Clinton was the most electable. So they used the exact same playbook and Democratic voters fell for it again. Because guess what? They agree with Bernie on the policies in every single state that voted. A majority of voters agree with Bernie Sanders. A majority of voters want Medicare for all, but they're voting strategically for the person who they think is best positioned to defeat Donald Trump. And, you know, part of this is the media brainwashing them, constantly getting them to think that if they want to beat Donald Trump, which is basically their number one goal, they have to go for Joe Biden. So maybe you don't like Joe Biden, but I mean, do you really want to beat Donald Trump or do you not? If you want to beat Trump, you've got to go for Joe Biden. And now we're in a position where there is so little enthusiasm for Joe Biden that there's even less enthusiasm for him than there was for Hillary Clinton. And any candidate who has very little enthusiasm ends up losing, Republican or Democrat, but especially Democrat, who again relies on turnout to win. What a goddamn disaster. And Democrats have nobody to thank but themselves for constantly trying to push home this point that Biden is the most electable. Biden did it too, but I mean, the media didn't have to fall in line. The media didn't have to do that. But here we are again. It's so incredibly frustrating. And, you know, the counterpoint will be, well, if, you know, way more people are enthusiastic about Bernie Sanders, then why isn't he winning? And I hear you. But we all live in a bubble. All of us who, you know, are very in tuned to what's going on in the Democratic Party primary, we are the exception, not the rule. So most people pay attention to presidential races in the general, not the primaries. So in the event Bernie Sanders were the nominee, I think his chances of winning would be better. I'm not going to say Bernie is, you know, a sure bet because nobody is. Donald Trump is more powerful now than he was back in 2016 because he has that advantage of incumbency. And he's running on a strong economy, which persuades voters more often than not, even if that economy isn't benefiting everyone. So, like, this combination is terrible. Joe Biden is weaker than Hillary Clinton, and he's going up against a stronger Donald Trump. Put two and two together. He's going to lose. If he wins, it'd be a miracle, basically. So, another four years of Donald Trump, I don't have to tell you... What a disaster that will be. Donald Trump will almost certainly name at least one more Supreme Court pick. But 
I'm honestly more concerned about the uh, judges that he will appoint to lower courts, the federal judges. He's been very effective at doing that. Uh, I'm terrified at four more years of undoing what little progress we've made when it comes to climate change. Undoing the Affordable Care Act. Like, it'd be a disaster. But this is a disaster that Democrats have to own if it in fact happens, right? I'm rooting against Trump. I'm not rooting for Biden because he alone is a disaster, but I'm certainly not rooting for Trump, and I hope he loses. I hope Biden is able to beat him if he's the nominee, even if I'm not going to support him. But Democrats got to own this. This is what they did. They made their bed. Now they've got to lie in it. Obama, you've got to own this, bud. Sorry. You, you know, hid behind the curtain here, and you got everyone to consolidate, drop out, support Joe Biden. You wanted this. You moved heaven and earth to make sure that Biden beats Bernie. So own it. This is your disaster. You've made your bed laying it. Democrats got to own this. They can't blame anyone but themselves. They knew that, you know, running a moderate who was unlikable didn't work in 2016. So to think that it would work in 2020, it's just stupidity. So they've got to own this. This is their making, their disaster in the making, more specifically. They've got to live with it. They can't blame us. This is their doing. I have been a supporter of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez since day one. You know, she came on my show, I interviewed her, and then when she won, like, I had tears in my eyes because I truly believed that maybe that was the beginning of a new era in American politics. Maybe the left finally would actually be able to obtain power and affect change. But some of what AOC has been doing lately, it just... It flies in the face of reason. What she's doing doesn't make sense. She's making political calculations that are very obviously antithetical to what the left wants, right? Now, I don't believe that we should tear down all of our allies. I think that we definitely need to hold them accountable. But what I do want people to understand is that when red flags present themselves very clearly to us, we have to take those red flags seriously, even if it may, might make us feel uncomfortable to do so. I had to force myself to fight through the cognitive dissonance to vet Tulsi Gabbard. And it turns out she's not the real deal. She endorsed Joe Biden. I, you know, vetted Andrew Yang and I went through why his agenda is actually very problematic. Elizabeth Warren abandoned progressives back in 2016 I don't think I was hard enough on her. Certainly, I was critical of her and was still criticized by centrists for being too hard on her. But those little red flags eventually add up. And it's to a point now where AOC is proving to us that even if she may still be an ally, in spite of the article that I'm going to read to you, her being the new standard bearer of progressivism in the United States, the new successor to Bernie Sanders... I just don't see it. I don't see it. Um, certainly, she is an ally to us. I'm not going to discount, you know, her value and what she brings to the table. But what she's doing here, the things that I will talk to you about based on this political article, um, they're very serious. And I've seen some of this. And, you know, I thought, I don't know if I should bring this up as an issue. Namely, one of them is her unwillingness to endorse Cori Bush. Cori Bush, as you all know, is someone who we desperately need in Congress. AOC enthusiastically endorsed her back in 2018, and now she's nowhere to be found. So we're going to read this article from Alex Thompson and Holly Otterbein of Politico, who write, Soon after her upset primary victory against the Democratic Party boss in 2018, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez traveled to St. Louis to prove her victory wasn't a one-off by campaigning for Cori Bush, who was similarly taking on a longtime Democratic congressman. Bush lost that race, but is challenging Representative William Lacey Clay again in an August primary. She has more money and higher name recognition and earned the endorsement of Bernie Sanders, but Ocasio-Cortez isn't helping Bush this time. Of the half dozen incumbent primary challengers, just as Democrats is backing the cycle, Ocasio-Cortez has endorsed just two. Neither was a particularly risky move. Both candidates, Jessica Cisneros in Texas and Marie Newman in Illinois, were taking on conservative Democrats who oppose abortion rights and later earned the support of several prominent national Democrats. 
Ocasio-Cortez's reluctance marks a break with the outsider tactics of the activist left represented by groups like Justice Democrats. Ocasio-Cortez's shift coincides with turnover among top aides in her congressional office, replacing some outspoken radicals with more traditional political professionals, along with a broader reckoning on the left on how to expand Sanders' coalition after his failure to significantly do so in the presidential primary. Ocasio-Cortez's endorsement moves are not a fluke, but part of a larger change over the past several months. After her disruptive burn it down early months in Congress, Ocasio-Cortez, who colleagues say is often conflict averse in person, has increasingly been trying to work more within the system. She is building coalitions with fellow Democratic members and picking her fights more selectively. After starting some high-profile fights with Speaker Nancy Pelosi and tweaking Democratic colleagues on Twitter early in her tenure, Ocasio-Cortez has been more conciliatory toward other House Democrats. In February, she dubbed Pelosi the mama bear of the Democratic Party. That makes me want to vomit. Over the past few weeks, Ocasio-Cortez has also chided Sanders supporters for online harassment and delivered soft critiques of Sanders and some of his allies for being too conflict-based. The moves have drawn surprise praise from some moderate and veteran Democrats. Neera Tandon, president of the liberal think tank Center for American Progress and a longtime Hillary Clinton aide, called Ocasio-Cortez's shift, quote, a sign of leadership. Instead of supporting Justice Democrats' full slate of incumbent challengers, Ocasio-Cortez launched her own PAC earlier this year that's been more focused on electing progressives in Republican-held or open seats. Ocasio-Cortez declined to be interviewed, but her new communications director, Lauren Hitt, noted that Bush's August 4th primary is still several months away and that the congresswoman is monitoring other primaries. Quote, we don't usually endorse so far out, Hitt said. Ocasio-Cortez, however, endorsed Newman six months before her primary and back to Cisneros more than four months before hers. The changes go beyond rhetoric and include personnel. Two of her most senior aides who worked on her insurgent campaign and co-founded Justice Democrats have left her operation. Chief of Staff Saikot Chakrabadi in August and Communications Director Corbin Trent earlier this month. The hiring of Lauren Hitt as Trent's replacement speaks to Ocasio-Cortez's new approach. An experienced operative, Hitt has worked for more moderate Democrats like Governor John Hickenlooper and Representative Beto O'Rourke during their recent presidential bid as well as left-wing candidates such as former New York gubernatorial contender Cynthia Nixon. Chakrabadi was a firebrand on the Hill. After Ocasio-Cortez's victory in November of 2018, he earned enemies in the Democratic caucus by declaring, we got a primary, folks. They were livid in June when he called some members new Southern Democrats. Ocasio-Cortez replaced him with legislative director Ariel Eckbland, who joined her office in January 2019 after working for Senator Kamala Harris. So long story short, she is withholding endorsements in crucial races where she could actually make a difference. And on top of that, she is replacing the more firebrand members of her staff with establishment approved choices, if you will. Um, embarrassing. And here's the thing. You have to acknowledge that the Democratic Party AOC, speaking directly to her, they are not your ally, they are your enemy. If somebody is punching you in the chest while another person is stabbing you, they're both bad. One may be causing more harm to you objectively than the other, but the person who's punching you still isn't your ally. They're your enemy, and they're hurting you actively. So trying to align with the corporate wing of the party isn't going to help you get progressive policies passed. And now I'm not saying that she is capitulating when it comes to policy, but you've got to have the correct strategy if you actually want those policies codified into law. To try to work with Democrats who are very openly corrupt corporatists, to call Nancy Pelosi mama bear of the Democratic Party, you're embarrassing yourself. You are embarrassing yourself. And this leads to people, I think, rightfully thinking you were co-opted in a number of ways. Maybe they've managed to bully you into silence because I've covered the articles of, you know, Democrats anonymously saying how horrible she is. So maybe she just got tired of fighting them and just decided this is easier for me going forward. I get it. But um, it's sad. Now, you can tell how effective uh, she is here 
um, not necessarily at winning over the Democratic Party, but just getting their approval temporarily, because we had that quote from Neera Tandon. And I also, I want to share what James Carville had to say about her, because this gives you an indication as to why she's doing this. You know, she's just tired of fighting them. Um, the Democratic Party is the party of coalitions, not a cult, said James Carville, a top strategist for Bill Clinton's 1992 campaign and vocal critic of Sanders during the primary. I've observed her and I think she's really talented. Wait, James Carville is saying this? That's weird. Um, that she's really smart. Maybe she is, I don't speak for her, coming to the conclusion that she wants to be part of the coalition. Ah, there it is. There it is. So they probably had a talk with her. Look, I get that you support all these progressive policies, but, you know, coming to Congress, protesting with the Sunrise Movement in the office of Nancy Pelosi... That's just not really how we do things here in D.C. And she said it herself. There's a lot of corporate voices in your ear, a lot of voices that want you to acquiesce, that will put pressure on you to bend you and ultimately break you. And it seems like that's the indication that we're getting, that the establishment broke AOC. I think she probably still believes in all the policies she came to Congress believing in. But what this article tells us is that she has been deluded into thinking that working with the establishment is the only way forward. Like, there were people quoted in this article saying, oh, this is a savvy move. No, it's not. You can't work with the enemy and expect to accomplish change because they're just going to placate you. They don't care about Medicare for all. They don't care about what your wing of the party has to say. They don't care. They don't like you, AOC. And Neera Tandon and James Carville, they're saying nice things about you to butter you up. But at the end of the day, they don't care about the left. So what are you doing? I don't get what you're doing. Look, this is the easier path for her, objectively speaking. I get that, right? It's probably really stressful for her to constantly be at war with people who she has to work with every single day. But here's the thing. This is what you signed up for. You signed up exactly for this job. You promised us you'd be a fighter for us. And calling Nancy Pelosi mama bear of the Democrats, I don't think that that's what people who voted for you wanted. They want you to go after Nancy Pelosi, who has blood on her hands. She refuses to back any of the policies that progressives want. So you can kiss her ass all you want. It's not going to change anything. So you don't have a choice. If you want progressive change, working with the Democrats is not the way to get progressive change. Fighting them at every step of the way is the way you get progressive change because you're the one with credibility. You're the one who has millions of followers and they don't. So you were a bigger threat to them when you actually fought them. But now that they're twisting your arm and trying to butter you up, you think that you're actually going to get things done? No, of course not. Of course not. Now, part of me is worried about even talking about this because here's the thing. Um, like it or not, I feel as though I am a representative of progressives and democratic socialists. And I like I don't feel like a representative, but what I'm saying is that like Democratic Party loyalists, Neera Tandon, Joanne Reed, they've used me before as an example as to how bad the Bernie Sanders movement is. So like I, I try to watch my P's and Q's as much as I possibly can while being authentic still. And I try not to be overly divisive, overly down. Um, so it's like by talking about this, I know what they're going to say about me, right? Joanne Reed has quoted me before, or not quoted me, but paraphrased what I said before. Uh, NBC News articles have quoted me, um, and they try to portray me and other progressives, to be fair, as toxic, right? So by talking about this, people are going to say, oh, well, look at Mike. He's just further proof that progressives and democratic socialists are toxic. And this is why they're not serious about getting power, because they're willing to tear down anyone the first moment they show signs that uh, they're not going to tow the progressive line or whatever that may be. But here's the thing. We know how powerful this system is. And I am smart enough to know that nothing I say or do, no matter how polite or civilized I try to be on camera, I'm not going to win them over. They're always going to be negative. So I have absolutely no reason to try to win these people over. 
And I want AOC to get that drift as well. Nothing she says or does will actually win them over. They don't like her. And so long as she truly believes in Medicare for all, um, they're not going to like her because she poses a threat to the status quo in the sense that she's doing or fighting for what their donors don't want. So by them trying to silence her, try to get her to acquiesce and co-opt her, they're doing that for their own good, not for her good. And I think she needs to get that. And, you know, I'm not trying to imply that she's as bad as Elizabeth Warren because she endorsed Bernie Sanders. So she already proved she, that she has more courage than Elizabeth Warren ever had. But we have to take seriously the red flags. And as a movement, we have to hold our own accountable and put pressure on them. And yes, they're going to say, look at these Bernie bros, they're toxic. She endorsed Bernie and they're still attacking her. We have to hold our own accountable and politely tell AOC that working with the establishment is like making a deal with the devil. It's never for your own good. It's for their own good. And you're not going to get policies accomplished by working with them. You have to fight them and break them, not let them break you. That's what Elizabeth Warren didn't get. And uh, that's why by trying to appease, you know, the center and the left, she ended up appeasing nobody, right? You have to pick a side. This is a civil war in the Democratic Party. This is intra-party warfare. So there's no way that you can walk that fine line and appease corporate Democrats and progressive Democrats simultaneously. You have to pick a side because our views are diametrically opposed. What we are in favor of, the corporate wing of the Democratic Party, is against. We're diametrically opposed. So AOC has got to realize that this is not the right path. This is not the right path. You can't do this, AOC. You have to endorse Cori Bush. You have to fight in the same way that you came into Congress fighting. And to even hire someone who worked with Beto O'Rourke or Kamala Harris shows that that's a big problem because the people who you work with in Congress, who you see daily, who advise you, little by little, they will shape your worldview. We saw how this affected Elizabeth Warren. Who she was when she announced her 2020 campaign was a different person by the end of it. And she already sucked when she announced, right? She was still the sellout spineless coward. But like comparing 2019 Warren to 2020 Warren, the difference is like night and day. So I'll end with this. So long as AOC continues fighting for the progressive policies that I want, I will always see her as an ally. But, but there's a caveat. I will never see her as a leader. I will never see her as the successor to Bernie Sanders' movement. Because if you are willing to get in bed with the establishment, whatever you think may be the benefit of that, it's not going to help you. You may think that doing this, kissing Nancy Pelosi's ass, hiring political operatives that worked with Kamala Harris and Beto O'Rourke is going to net you a benefit, make you stronger, better position you to fight for policies like Medicare for All and a Green New Deal. But I promise you, it absolutely will not. The only option that we have, if we ever want to get progressive policies passed, is to absolutely win over the corporate wing. And I don't mean win them over and get them on our side. I mean win, beat them. Kick them out of the party. Force party realignment where they join the Republican Party. Take over the Democratic Party permanently. Working with them is not an option. And I say that not necessarily because I don't believe it to be true, but because empirical evidence, what we've seen, proves it to be true. So, um, you know, I, I've had my concerns with AOC for quite some time. Namely, the Cori Bush endorsement is something that I've been watching. And uh, I'll just say, if she doesn't endorse Cori Bush... She's proving to everyone that um, she's not the real deal. And this is, a, you know, it's a cowardly thing to do, to abandon someone who you desperately need in Congress with you to fight for the policies you say you believe in. So um, you have no choice. If you genuinely want Medicare for all, Green New Deal, raising the minimum wage, you have to endorse Cori Bush. You can still believe in those policies, but you're not serious about getting them. If you're going to allow all these really important progressive primary challengers to just fight their own battles. Like, progressives worked like hell to get you elected. 
People like myself and Kyle Kalinske berated Ro Khanna when he didn't endorse you. And then he did the dual endorsement, which is better than nothing. But we fought to get you elected. And we fought to, you know, extend your platform. Don't betray us like this. Because you're not helping yourself and us get progressive policies. You're just helping the corporate wing. In an Instagram live stream, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez responded to the claims made by the Politico article about how she is, you know, um, pivoting a little bit towards being less divisive and trying to work with Democrats as opposed to, you know, challenging them at every step of the way. And she responded by basically dismissing the concerns of progressives. Take a look. Oh, well, if anything, I've only gotten more ardent in my positions, but I do think it's funny that uh, all these folks that one day are like, keep your third eye open, manufacture consent, are the same ones who fall the fastest for these ploys. Yeah, I think that this tweet put it best. I guess y'all missed that part of manufacturing consent where Chomsky calls Nancy Pelosi his political mama bear. Exactly. Now, I get the point that she's trying to make. I believe that the media would, of course, want nothing more for than the left to eat itself and attack AOC and push her further into the arms of the Democratic Party establishment. However, the article was written in part by Holly Otterbein, and um, that's kind of an insult to her as she's one of the better reporters at Politico. And what she mentions here are several facts. These aren't, you know, things that she made up. This isn't her analysis. These are facts that she presented us with in this article. You called Nancy Pelosi mama bear. Now, maybe, you know, that's something that we can dismiss. Maybe I'm being a little bit too petty, but I don't think kissing the ass of the person who has laughed at you, essentially, and tried to marginalize you within Congress is a good idea. She called your Green New Deal the Green Dream or whatever. So trying to play nice with her and, you know, calling her the mama bear, I think that that's problematic. I think that it legitimizes someone who the left should absolutely view as the enemy because Nancy Pelosi, quite frankly, is our enemy. On top of that, the article mentions how you're not endorsing primary challengers who are taking on incumbent Democrats. That's an issue. Address that. Additionally, the article cites how you factually, this isn't made up, decided to get rid of more radical members of uh, your your team, like uh, Corbin Trent, Shaikat Chakrabadi, and replace them with establishment-approved choices. You also scolded Bernie Sanders supporters for not being civilized enough. Now, I'm not saying that you're a sellout, but what I'm saying is that these are very big red flags, and I think that you should address them, and I think that you should pay respect to the movement that got you elected. Without progressives, you wouldn't be in that position, so at a minimum, even if you think these claims are laughable, even if you think, you know, our fears are a bit much, you at least owe us the respect to not laugh and try to gaslight us by saying, oh, Noam Chomsky, manufacturing consent. No, that's not what this article is trying to do. That's not what this article is trying to do. There are legitimate concerns, red flags that it would be nice for you to address. Now, you don't have to, but to just kind of laugh it off, I find that insulting because we worked really hard to get you elected. Now, again, I'm not saying that you're selling out or anything like that. I'm overall just, I'm irritated with the strategy that you're choosing to pursue because I know that you think that working with the establishment and being less divisive is going to put you in a better position to get policies like Medicare for All passed, but that shows that you fundamentally misunderstand politics in America. Because the reason why Nancy Pelosi and corporate Democrats aren't choosing to back policies like Medicare for All isn't because progressives are too impolite. It's not because, you know, you're not taking Nancy Pelosi out to dinner and kissing her ass enough. It's because she has corporate donors that pay her to be against these policies. So changing up your tone, being more civilized, that is not going to impact policy outcomes at all. So what you have to do is name and shame these politicians until they are uh, afraid to go against the movement. I mean, at first, AOC, she was, you know, she was putting pressure on leadership and other Democrats. And that was a really effective strategy because they were worried. There were articles that I shared on this program 
where members of Congress didn't want to, you know, um, offend AOC, if you will. They didn't want her horde of Twitter followers going after them, so they tried to, you know, play it safe and uh, not speak up or only talk on the condition of anonymity if they wanted to uh, talk shit about AOC. So your strategy, the one that you're pursuing now, you may think it's going to help you, but it's not. But here's the thing, we can disagree on strategy. That's perfectly fine. But I think that you owe us an explanation. And if you don't want to say anything at a minimum, don't laugh off the claims or the legitimate concerns that people have that were brought up in this article, rightfully so, by Holly Otterbein. Like, to just kind of, like, disregard the concerns that progressives have, I view that as a slap in the face. Because, again, we did everything in our power to help get you elected. I brought you on this show to interview you, to tell my viewers to donate to your campaign. So we helped you. So we feel like we're a part of this together. So for you to just kind of disregard us now, it's it's a little bit uh, frustrating to say the least. Like, you should be trying to pay it forward. Like, once you get in, you shouldn't close the door behind you. Still, help other progressives running. Endorse Cori Bush. What are you doing? Endorse, you know, uh, the other progressives that are running. I've had 30 progressives on my program. And you're choosing to endorse uh, only the safest choices. The only one that she endorsed that I've had on my program was Sam Elise Lopez. So I just, I don't, I don't think that this is going to help you by, you know, um, kind of brushing aside the concerns of progressives that I think are legitimate and, you know, getting cozy with the establishment. And I'll repeat that I don't think that she is a sellout. But we don't want you to go that, down that path to where being a sellout is possible, to where you become compromised, to where you get a little bit friendly with the establishment and they start to influence your worldview, as your staffers can do. It happened with Elizabeth Warren. So that's all I'll say. Um, AOC is a good politician, um, so long as she's fighting for Medicare for All and all the policies that I, uh, that I agree with. But if the strategy doesn't pan out well, and I don't think it will, then um, we told you so. But I mean, if you think you know best, if you truly believe that kissing the ass of Nancy Pelosi is the best strategy, all right, we'll just have to agree to disagree. But when we bring up these concerns and we vocalize our disagreements, at least pay us the respect to not be condescending during our Instagram live streams and dismiss our concerns as, uh, you know, we're falling for the media trap. You know, we're smarter than that. And I would expect you to know that. So Bernie Sanders press spokesperson, Brianna Joy Gray, she is probably the sweetest person ever. She genuinely cares about the plight of the less fortunate and the marginalized. And you can see it. Like, everything she does is advocate for, you know, people who need health care, who need education, who need student debt relief. So, you know, every once in a while, she'll respond to politicians and effectively shame them into coming around to a better position. Now, one person, Kamala Harris, who uh, I believe maybe it was in... Uh, uh, 1990, uh, 1995, no, that's right, it was in 2017, endorsed Medicare for All, but all of a sudden, she, uh, doesn't talk about Medicare for All. It's almost like she endorsed that policy for purposes of political expediency and then ran away from it the minute it became uh, a little bit inconvenient. But she put out a tweet saying that tests and, um, healthcare for COVID-19 treatments should be free. Now, I have no disagreements with Kamala Harris there, except the difference between her and I is that I believe that everything should be free when it comes to healthcare. Chemo treatments, uh, insulin, everything should be free at the point of service. Because uh, if you don't agree with that, then I genuinely want to hear from you. What illnesses, what diseases do you think people should have to pay for? Because that's what I genuinely want to know. So Kamala Harris put out this tweet saying, Testing for coronavirus and treatment needs to be free, period. To which Brianna Joy Gray responded saying, This is a good start, but is it okay to die from cancer or diabetes because you're poor? And I totally agree with this point. I think that this is um, not controversial at all. And Joe Biden has said the same thing via Twitter. He said that, you know, treatments and care for COVID-19 should be free. And, you know, the left always responds by predictably saying, all right, well, if you think that should be free, why don't you think that treatments for chemo should also be free? Why should people who get cancer 
which is out of their control, mind you, have to be forced into bankruptcy because they don't have health insurance. Why shouldn't chemo be free as well? And I think it's a basic logical point. We're basically calling on them to do better. We're calling on them to be better than the milk toast neoliberals that they are to their cores, right? It's just asking them to extend the logic that they're using for this issue to every single healthcare related issue. So you'd think that this is a benign tweet. It's not controversial, except all hell broke loose because Brianna Joy Gray dared to respond to Queen Kamala Harris. How dare you question her? And when I say that all hell broke loose, all hell broke loose. Basically, on Twitter the entire day, um, shitlib centrists were dogging on Brianna Joy Gray because she dared to ask Kamala Harris to offer peasants a little bit more than crumbs. So, for example, Zerlina Maxwell scolded her for her tone, tweeting, The tone of this tweet is mean and disrespectful, especially considering Kamala's mother died from cancer. Well, wouldn't you think that if that were the case, she'd be even more radical in her claim that healthcare should be free at the point of service? Because if you saw firsthand the way that your mother died from cancer, which is tragic, then can you imagine an extra layer of tragedy if somebody died from cancer, but you don't even know if they could have been saved because they couldn't afford treatment? Like, that doesn't prove your point. It makes you look petty it makes it seem as if Kamala Harris should be doing better be you know a better advocate for people who are suffering with cancer who don't have health insurance or maybe they're underinsured so this doesn't help you I don't know what Zerlina Maxwell thought that she was doing but she's one of the biggest hacks in American politics so of course she's going to make sure that she is there she has the back of her team members at all costs Bakari Sellers responded by saying this is toxic. She's been a part of the problem. Yes, advocating for poor people to have health care, definitely part of the problem. And Shermichael Singleton responded saying we've both been in politics long enough to know that this person is putting herself in a very bad position for future opportunities. I hope she knows exactly what she's doing because making unnecessary enemies is a fool's errand. To which Bakari Sellers responded saying we remember. So now what they're doing is they're literally threatening her livelihood they're saying well you know we're gonna remember this when you look for a job in dc we're gonna remember that you said this this toxicity will remember it i mean these people are absolutely ruthless and they police us for our tone they're trying to police brianna joy gray for her tone but in the same breath they're basically saying because you said something that we don't like we think that you should never get a job in this town in D.C. ever again. How fucked up is that? And these are just a few examples. Like, when I say that people were dogging on her all day, I mean, she was the number one trending topic on Twitter yesterday. And even celebrities, like Yvette Nicole Brown, got in on the action and shared this poorly photoshopped image of Nina Turner and Brianna Joy Gray as diamond and silk. So because she dared to advocate on behalf of people who don't have health care... She is like MAGA chuds, diamond and silk. How fucking disgusting and morally reprehensible you are as a human being to think that she's like these fascist clowns because she thinks that people shouldn't die because uh, they don't have health care. This is embarrassing. Like, how are we supposed to work with these people? How are we supposed to continuously hold hands and sing kumbaya with these centrist neoliberals when they get offended, literally, if you dare to advocate that everyone should have health care, how are we supposed to work with them? The answer is, we can't work with them. That's the answer. And once you realize that these centrist shitlibs are not your allies, once you realize that they're your enemies, if you're a lefty, then politics makes a lot more sense. They are working to undermine you at every step of the way. What you are for, they are against. What you're fighting for, they're fighting you to stop that. These people are not your friends. The Democratic Party, they are not your friends. There is a civil war going on in this party. There's intra-party warfare. And let me say this, anyone who thinks that they can, you know, uh, appease both sides... 
Elizabeth Warren, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, to a lesser extent, you're horribly mistaken. You can't ride the fence, you've got to pick a side. It's the left or the center. One has to win and the other has to lose. We're not going to come to any agreement. Uh, there's going to be a perpetual butting of our heads until one completely overrides the other. Until the other is beaten into oblivion and can't return. Whether that's the centrists, whether that's progressives, I don't know who. But one of us has to win and the other has to lose. Period. Now, I will be fighting like hell to make sure that the left prevails, right? But you have to acknowledge that these people are not our political allies. Centrists are not your allies. Ideologically speaking, they're closer to Republicans than the left. So to call them centrists is kind of a misnomer in a way because they're not actually centrists. They're center-right. We're leftists, and we're not even that radical when you consider the fact that most developed countries have some form of universal health care, be it single-payer or a national health system. So these people are not your friends. They're not your allies. They're your enemies. Because if they are going to freak out and have this meltdown because Brianna Joy Gray dared to advocate for health care for poor people, do you honestly think, ask yourself, can you work with these people? Are these people even worth your time? I think the answer is clear. It's an unequivocal no. Fuck these people. Fuck centrist Democrats. We have to absolutely beat them. Otherwise, um, them and Republicans, who they claim to hate so much, will continue to win, politically speaking, because they agree on basically everything. They do. Democrats and Republicans, that line between them is getting a lot more blurred, and it's going to happen if centrists keep winning. So just know what you're getting yourself into. The Democratic Party, their leadership, most of their members, their followers, their loyalists, they're not your friends, they are your enemy. Never forget that fact. As many of you know, Bernie Sanders appeared on ABC's The View once again, and this show is, um, how do I put this politely? Trash. It's basically Fox News for centrists, Karens, wine moms, and shit libs alike. And as you could have predicted, they weren't too kind to Bernie Sanders. But before I even play any portion of their interview with him, look at this preview that they aired for the upcoming interview. Bernie Sanders answer accusations that he's politicizing the pandemic to push his Medicare for all agenda and that staying in the race could guarantee Trump another term. He's live on The View. Next. This is pants on head, worms in your brain, downright fucking idiocy. To accuse someone of politicizing health care during a global pandemic is fucking Stupid. That's like saying you're politicizing war by talking about peace. So to even suggest that politicization of healthcare is possible during a literal global pandemic where people desperately need healthcare more than ever, I don't even know like how many people this passed through before they approved it, but this makes them look very stupid. Like even their viewers who are brainwashed can't hear that and think, wow, what a cogent point. It's stupidity. Now, on top of that, they said that by him staying in the race, he could guarantee Trump another victory. That is what I like to call a propaganda fail because your words are at odds with one another. Could he or will he guarantee the victory? You see, they want you to think that Bernie's ongoing presence in this race could lead to Joe Biden losing. And you see, they're already pre-blaming him for Joe Biden's defeat because you know that that's what they were going to do. But let's get into the actual nitty gritty here because Whoopi Goldberg really starts to hammer him on why he won't drop out of the race. And Whoopi Goldberg is a very smug, insufferable individual, but I've never seen her more condescending than in this clip. Take a look. I have to ask you this question now because I've been watching to see what you were going to do. Uh, and I'm told that you intend to stay in this race uh, for president because you believe there is a path to victory. I want to know what that path is, because this feels a little bit like it did when you didn't come out 
when uh, Hillary Clinton was clearly well, the person folks were going for. So can you explain why you're still in the race yeah, well, and what this not, path is that well, you I, see? I, I, well, one of the reasons, but that's not quite accurate. I worked as hard as I could to uh, for Hillary Clinton. But the reason, there is a, uh, a, well, a, but I, a path Bernie, for just, just so we're clear, you, you worked for Hillary, but it took you a very, very long time to, to, to hop in. And your people also, it took a very long time for them well, to uh, hop in. So right. well, I, be, when I say that, that's what I'm it. talking about. Yeah, well, I, I don't accept that characterization. But the point is, okay. people have a right Why are you to still in the democracy. Race? People have a right. Last I heard, people in a democracy have a right to vote, and they have a right to vote for the agenda that they think can work for America, especially in this very, very difficult moment. We are assessing our campaign, as a matter of fact, where we want to go forward. But people in a democracy uh -huh. do have a right to vote. And right now, in this unprecedented moment in American history, I think we need to have a very serious discussion about how we go forward. And one of the things that I am working on with other members of the Senate and Congress is a new stimulus package, which not only makes sure that all of our people in this crisis have health care, but also that they continue to receive their paycheck. We have got to understand where we are at. And right now is April 1st. It is likely possible there are millions of people who cannot pay their rent. They are really lucky that Bernie Sanders is so nice because if I were in Bernie Sanders' position, just to spite them, I would declare that I'm not going anywhere, I'm staying in all the way until the convention, and if I don't win, then I'll be running as an independent, maybe I'll be endorsing the Green Party nominee. Like, they don't realize that if Bernie Sanders really wanted to be nasty, he could be nasty, and I think it's warranted given all of the poor treatment that they've given him. I mean, think about this. Back in 2015, when the Republican Party establishment and Fox News were all pressuring Donald Trump to, you know, support the nominee, don't be divisive, after he basically said, I would run as an independent if they're, if they're going to treat me like this. Um, what did he do? Well, after signing a loyalty pledge, he doubled down and said, actually, maybe I will run as an independent. Like, Bernie has got to understand that these people, they don't like him. He's only useful to them insofar as he provides them with ratings and he's willing to be obedient. But since he's not being obedient, since he's not obeying like a good little soldier and falling in line and supporting Joe Biden, they absolutely despise him. And it's funny how Whoopi Goldberg is pretending to be a good journalist there. But why wouldn't she bring on Joe Biden and ask him about the credible rape allegation? that uh, nobody in the media is talking about. If you actually want to be a trailblazer, be a good journalist, Whoopi Goldberg, if that's what you're calling yourself now, I don't know what, why wouldn't you actually be a serious person and focus on the real issues and not trying to pressure Bernie Sanders to drop out when half the country hasn't even made their voices heard? Now, what irritated me even more about that clip is uh, the aftermath when Democratic Party hack Alyssa Milano was so pleased with Whoopi's questioning that she tweeted out, Thank you, Whoopi Goldberg. This moment in time is too important to take bullshit from our politicians. Hey, Alyssa, any word on the rape allegations against the candidate that you support? Like, you're this huge feminist icon, a leader in the Me Too movement, no? Why haven't you said anything about the rape allegations? Don't act like you don't see us tweeting this news to you. Don't act like you don't see us pressing you to give an answer. We know you hear us, you're just choosing to ignore it because you know it makes you look really hypocritical. So the best move for you is to pretend like they don't exist. So rather than focusing on Bernie Sanders, why don't you focus on your friend, as you call him, and ask him whether or not these rape allegations are legitimate and why he hasn't called for an FBI investigation into the claims of Tara Reid. Why haven't you done that yet, Alyssa Milano? Until you do that, kindly shut the fuck up. Now, moving on, they get to the discussion about Medicare for All, and this is where the interview really goes uh, off the rails, because they uh, pose the question to Bernie Sanders about Medicare for All and how it would be valuable during a global pandemic, which should be obvious, but they um, set up the question by basically lying about other systems, other countries with single payer systems, to be exact. Take a look. Countries with universal health care routinely have to wait longer and sometimes die before receiving many of the medical treatments. Right now, if you can't afford it to wait, because 
Corona isn't, uh, they're, they're having this, it, it, it's not something you can wait on health care for. So what would your counter be to why that would be beneficial right now? Well, Sarah, I mean, the truth is that there are long waiting lines before Corona virus. Uh, there were long waiting lines uh, in treatment for uh, people who need health care. Uh, the truth is that uh, in our country, uh, there are, for many, in many, many instances, other countries for normal procedures get health care a lot more rapidly than we do in this country. We have areas of America right now, in rural areas, for example, where you don't have the kind of doctors we should, where hospitals are being closed down. We are paying far more for prescription drugs than are the people in any other country, in some cases, 10 times more because we don't negotiate prices for prescription drugs. So I don't accept the basic premise uh, of your argument. I think the truth is that in Canada and other countries around the world, their health care systems are far more popular than our system is because the function of our system, to be honest, is to make billions of dollars in profits for the insurance companies and the drug companies not to provide quality care to all people. I want to repeat what she said. Countries with universal health care routinely have to wait longer and sometimes die before receiving many of the medical treatments. Okay, um, what study are you citing? Which country are you talking about? What anecdotes do you have to prove this point? Name it. Provide us with the study. Provide us with the data. Oh, you don't have that because you're lying. Because guess what? Every single country has wait times, including the United States, and some countries with national or single-payer systems actually have shorter wait times than the United States. Now, our neighbor Canada, they actually do have longer wait times than us, but let me ask you this question. How many people in Canada die because they don't have health care? The answer is zero people. Now contrast that with the United States. How many people in this country die every single year because they don't have health care? 68,000. This is not according to Mike from the Humanist Report. This is according to a peer-reviewed Yale study. What do you have? Where's your data? Where's your numbers? Where's your studies? Cite them or shut the fuck up. See, the thing that they don't tell you about is elective procedures. You know, that does have a longer waiting time because everyone is covered so if there is a procedure that is more urgent they're going to prioritize that person that individual who needs a necessary procedure to survive will jump to the front of the line and sometimes those just seeking elective procedures minor surgeries have to wait a little bit longer but guess what nobody dies because they don't have health care zero people die in canada because they don't have health care so you can try to cite uh, statistics and facts, but if you really want to play that game, I advise you not to unless you want to look like an absolute fucking liar. Now, believe it or not, it gets worse because Sonny Hostin comes in and she brings up the claim that Bernie Sanders is supposedly politicizing a global pandemic by talking about the number one thing that we should be looking at during a global pandemic, healthcare. Take a look. Some are accusing you of using the pandemic to push uh, Medicare for all. And um, they're saying, you know, at a time, at this time, we should put politics aside and, and come together uh, behind the president. Uh, what is your response to politicizing well, this allegation I think we that should. Uh, everyone is politicizing? Well, I don't this? know who is making the allegation. You know, I have political opponents who make all kinds of accusations, but... Should we put politics aside and all come together? Of course we should. And when we all come together, it seems to me we have to do several things. One of them is guarantee health care to all people right now. The absurdity that you may be diagnosed with the coronavirus and you go into the hospital and you spend thousands of dollars getting treated and maybe, God willing, you come out alive, well, you got a huge bill out there. If you're being diagnosed with cancer right now, the truth is that we have 500,000 people a year who go bankrupt because of medically related bills. So let us come together. You're absolutely right. But in coming together, we got to do a couple of things. And one thing to say that, especially in this crisis, people should not have to worry about the cost of health care. They should not have to worry about whether they can afford prescription drugs or not. 
They should not have to worry whether the pharmaceutical industry is going to make billions of dollars by creating a vaccine that will be unaffordable to ordinary people. It must be free to all. So let's come together it, on that premise. Oh, so some people are accusing Bernie Sanders of politicizing this issue? Who? Name them. Name the author of the article you read. You sound like Donald Trump, Sonny. Many people are saying that you are politicizing this pandemic. My Trump impression is horrible, but I mean, you get the point. You're saying that. Just admit it. And as she broadcasts from her mansion, her beautiful home, I think that she should just be honest and word that question in the way that we know she wants to. Why should I, a multimillionaire who gets paid so much money, more than most Americans will have in their lives, um, why should I give a shit about poor people dying? I have healthcare. Fuck them. I got mine. Why should I care about poor people? Just, just like word the question that way. We know that you don't care about poor people dying, Sonny. You've been very clear. You've been very hostile towards Medicare for all. You and your hosts at The View. But just admit that you don't care that 68,000 people die every single year because they don't have health care. Their lives don't matter to you because you are an elitist, right? And continuing to push this issue of Medicare for all makes your party, your team look bad because they are unwilling to support it because they've been bought and paid for by the private health industry. So just admit that you don't actually care about the lives of poor people and them dying it doesn't matter to you because the talk of Medicare for all is inconvenient because it makes your team look bad. Just fucking admit it, you goddamn hacks. You goddamn frauds. Like, these are genuinely bad people. And um, I saw a tweet from uh, June, otherwise known as Shoe on Head on Twitter, who put up a poll and said, if you had to destroy one, but only one, between Fox News, MSNBC, and The View, after this segment, I think I would have to choose The View. Because when it comes to who's doing the most damage in this country, The View has to be towards the top of that list. Because think about this. People who watch Fox News, it's a certain segment of the population who will always believe Fox News no matter what. And the same is true for MSNBC. But when it comes to The View... That's also true, but the problem is that people who watch The View, I'm assuming, are a bit more apolitical than MSNBC viewers. So people who otherwise don't necessarily have any strong political positions are getting this biased take, and they are shaping the worldview of apolitical Karens everywhere. So, I mean, The View has got to be one of the most harmful shows because of the misinformation that they spread. Actively, you saw it. That host literally tried to claim that people are dying in countries with single-payer health care because they have to wait so long. That's not happening. And if it is, prove me wrong, cite a study. Just one. Just one. You can't do it because you are fucking liars manufacturing consent. So um, the view is just terrible. And I've said this before, and I'm going to say it every single time I talk about the view. The collective IQ of the United States would increase by at least... 10, maybe 15 points if this show were canceled. And the day that it's canceled, we should all be celebrating because that means that Americans will be a little bit smarter by not having to listen to these rich clowns talk down to the peasants from their ivory towers while pretending to know what they're talking about, while pretending to care what the peasants go through as they tell you how bad Medicare for all is from their fucking mansions where they're protected. So I'll be the first to admit that I don't agree with Marianne Williamson on everything, but out of everyone else who ran for president in 2020, she is the only one besides Bernie Sanders who actually has proven to be principled, who actually cares about the issues. And where I disagree with her on the policy, I don't think it's because she's bought or sold out or not courageous enough. I think there's just a legitimate policy disagreement. So Marianne Williamson is someone who I, I just... I have grown to really respect lately and she keeps defending Bernie and it's making me love her anymore because at a time where you have basically no allies in mainstream media and American politics, it's nice to see at least someone willing to speak out for you. So as you all know, The View recently interviewed Bernie Sanders and it was an absolute train wreck. I covered that in a different video. We won't rehash it, but Alyssa Milano tweeted out a segment 
um, where she thanked Whoopi Goldberg, saying this moment in time is too important to take bullshit from our politicians. And she said this in response to Whoopi Goldberg pressing Bernie Sanders to drop out. Now, in response to this, Marianne Williamson says this to Alyssa Milano. Bernie has nothing to apologize for, Alyssa. The bullshit here isn't coming from him. She then added, George Washington warned us against political parties, saying it would create factions of people more concerned with their faction than with their country. Those placing the will of the DNC before the will of the people are doing exactly what he warned us against. It's ludicrous. Here. I think you dropped this, queen. Put it on. It's your crown. Put it on. <laughs> I have no choice but to stand her from this point forward. Um, she's correct. American politics, we don't often talk about policy. This has devolved into a team sport where everyone on one side is rah-rah team blue and everyone on the other side is rah-rah team red and you have a small subsection of the electorate, the left, who genuinely cares about policy above everything else. We're not looking at charisma. We're not looking at strategy insofar as, you know, that helps us get the policies we want codified into law, but it's policy over platitudes and personality. That's where we're coming from. Um, so it's nice to see someone with a high profile call out that team sport, especially when it's gotten to the point where they're arguing which rapist is better. Like, they're saying now, at least our team captain hasn't raped as many women as your team captain. So he has a lot of raping to do to catch up. Like, this is a real tweet that somebody said. That's where we're at. That's the state of American politics. Because people are so blinded by party loyalty that they are willing to abandon all of their principles, all to make sure that their team wins. This is a game to them. This is a game. They don't care about policy. Alyssa Milano is a multi-millionaire who's going to be fine regardless of who occupies the White House and Congress. To her, this is basically a hobby. It doesn't matter the outcome of policies isn't going to impact her life in any way, shape, or form. She's privileged. So it's nice to see people like Marianne Williamson, who doesn't have to care, genuinely care, care about poor people, want to fix the country, want to heal the divide in a real way. So I don't really have much left to say about this. I just wanted to share this. Uh, Marianne Williamson lately has been so great. And look, I think that we all really began to respect her once she ripped Dave Rubin a new asshole. That was just lovely to see. But there were some dark moments where she, you know, claimed that she couldn't support Medicare for All at a debate because she'd be an agent of chaos. And then she was a little wishy-washy on it there. But look, if she genuinely comes around to Medicare for All and actually advocates for it, like, I could support her in the future. Who else is there? Like, <laughs> that's, that's where we're at, right? Um... It'd be difficult for her to build a political coalition or, you know, build up her name recognition in the way that Bernie has. But at this point, you know, um, who's going to be the next successor to Bernie Sanders? Maybe it's Marianne Williamson. I don't know. But all I know is right now in the moment, I really appreciate what she's doing. I, um, I have a newfound respect for her and I have no choice but to stand um, the new queen of the progressive left. So far, many states have chosen to postpone their primaries until June, and rightfully so, because we're dealing with a global pandemic that has no end date. We don't necessarily know how long self-quarantine and social distancing will be required, so the best course of action for states currently is to postpone their primaries to June and, in the meanwhile, get in place some sort of vote-by-mail mechanism to allow people to make their voices heard. But not all states have postponed their primaries. Wisconsin is set to vote on April 7th, and as you all know, that's unsafe. After Joe Biden and Tom Perez all insisted that it was safe for people to vote on March 17th, guess what happened? People got infected with COVID-19. This happened in Florida. You have elderly people who are vulnerable working the polls. It's not safe. So people shouldn't be forced to risk their lives to make their voices heard. Like, you shouldn't have to weigh whether or not exercising your democratic right to vote 
is more important than risking your life. Like, this isn't real democracy, right? In third world countries, if we see a level of, uh, a level of intimidation that makes people, you know, disinclined to vote, we say that that election is illegitimate. So here, we should hold ourselves to the same standard that we hold third world countries to. If our citizens feel afraid to vote, we have to postpone that vote implement vote by mail in the meantime. And Bernie Sanders thankfully spoke out. He agrees. He tweeted, people shouldn't have to put their lives on the line to vote. Wisconsin should join the 15 states delaying elections, delay Tuesday's vote, extend early voting, and work to send every voter a ballot by mail. While we wait for a decision, we urge our supporters to vote by mail. Now, the response from centrists, if I'm allowed to generalize here, has been basically to attack Bernie Sanders for not dropping out. Because basically the burden here is being put on him. Since he is choosing to stay in the race, well then him, single-handedly, he's the one responsible for putting people's lives at risk. Because he's going to lose, in their view, so what does it matter? You know, it's not on states who have had ample time to institute some sort of vote by mail. It's not on them. It's not their responsibility. The responsibility is on Bernie Sanders to drop out. Interesting. It's almost like they have a political agenda and they don't care about democracy. Now, when it comes to Wisconsin, Bernie Sanders is down like 25 points, according to the last poll that I saw. So even if you postpone it to June, I don't think he's going to make up that deficit. It would be very, very difficult for him. So this isn't even about politics. This is about protecting people's lives. So I know that Democrats want to hurry up and rush through this primary so they can coronate Joe Biden, but I don't think they have to worry. Things most likely won't change. Bernie isn't out of the running yet, but will he likely win? Probably not. So rather than pressuring Bernie Sanders to drop out, just do the right fucking thing and implement vote by mail. Like, think of what they're saying here. Half of the Democratic Party has yet to vote, and they're blaming Bernie for staying in the race, rather than trying to give voters an extra option. Look, my niece, she uh, turned 19, and she is finally old enough to vote for the very first time, and she will enthusiastically be supporting Bernie Sanders. You really want to deny her her right to vote, something she's enthusiastic to do for the first time? And it's not just my niece. A lot of people, Zoomers, are finally eligible to vote. And the Democratic Party wants to silence all of them just to wrap up this primary because they are too lazy or too stupid to carry out some sort of vote-by-mail procedure by June. No. Fuck off. People deserve to vote. People deserve to make their voices heard. I haven't gotten a chance to vote. Do I think that, you know, these upcoming primaries are going to change the dynamics of this race. Not necessarily, but we still need to make our voices heard. We have two very different options, and I want to be able to vote and have my fucking say. Is that too difficult? Like, it's so frustrating to me that the Democratic Party never takes responsibility. They always find a scapegoat. In this instance, it's Bernie Sanders. It's not them for being too stupid to carry out vote by mail when they knew this was going to be an issue, when they knew these primaries were coming up, they blame Bernie Sanders. Look, this party is uh, doing everything they possibly can do to drive away voters and not allowing people to make their voices heard by forcing them to risk their lives to vote during a global pandemic. That's not going to make you any more popular. So do the right thing, postpone these primaries, and while you postpone them, implement vote by mail. It's not that difficult. If you can't do this, then uh, maybe you're not competent enough to run the country. Figure it out. Get it done. As much as centrists like to tone police the left, lately their own tone has been getting a little bit out of control and their calls for Bernie Sanders to drop out haven't just gotten expectedly louder. We all expected this, knew it would happen, uh, but they are now getting a little bit nastier and they've resorted to name calling in order to cry bully Bernie out of the Democratic Party primary. So, as The Hill's Amy Parnes and Jonathan Easley report, Joe Biden's allies are privately grumbling that Senator Bernie Sanders will not get out of the presidential race, preventing the party from uniting ahead of the general election. Sanders' decision to stay in the race has Democrats worried they are repeating the problem of 2016 when a long primary fight was seen as hurting Hillary Clinton, the eventual nominee. 
At the same time, frustration is growing among some of Biden's aides and allies behind the scenes as the coronavirus pandemic has effectively sidelined Biden and President Trump's approval rating has been on the rise. Team Biden believes that it's impossible for him to fully pivot to taking on Trump while Sanders is still in the race. And there are growing fears that they're losing valuable time. I think he should get out, one Biden aide said. It's a lost cause for him and everyone knows it. If you really care about beating Donald Trump, you'd get out and help consolidate the party in what is already a very stressful time for the nation. It's not helpful to anyone to stay in, period. The aide also said Sanders is unlikely to win more policy concessions from Biden by remaining in the race. Quote, I don't think they can push Biden any more to the left than he's gone. <laughs> how, how far to the left has he gone exactly? The aide said, but what he can do is solidify support and make sure we don't have another four years of Donald Trump. The longer they stay in, the worse it is. At a certain point, it looks selfish and self-centered. Somehow he's made this all about himself. Quote, he's had lots of time to bow out gracefully and now he needs to do the right thing, one major Democratic donor said. It's April. We're dealing with a global pandemic. The country is in a deep recession and the last thing we need is Bernie Sanders telling us what we're doing wrong. Give me a fucking break. Time is of the essence. We all need to be on the same team right now. Another fundraiser was more blunt. He's an asshole. It's over. Bernie folks are clinging as they always do. So basically their message is... Fuck you, drop out so we can unify, dickhead. <laughs> These people are so insufferable. No, how about this? Go fuck yourself. If I were Bernie Sanders, I would stay in all the way until the convention and then run as an independent against Joe Biden. I'd say fuck you. Because look, everything that they're saying about the necessity of beating Donald Trump, the need to unify as if there'd ever be any unity between them and us, it's all bullshit because let me remind you what Joe Biden said back when Bernie Sanders was the front runner just a little over a month ago. Quote, Biden says he'll contest the Democratic nomination if no one gets a majority of delegates. If Sanders leads in delegates but doesn't have a majority, Biden said he'll fight for the nomination. So now that Biden doesn't have a majority, he has a plurality even though he's in the lead, it seems like going by Biden standards... Bernie Sanders should, in fact, stay in and fight for the nomination because back then, Biden didn't cite concerns about the need to unify and beat Donald Trump. He just said, I'm going to stay in and fight for the nomination. So guess what? Take that. Shove it up your ass. Bernie isn't going anywhere and neither are we. And if you think that bullying Bernie out of the race is going to help us unify, you've got another thing coming because I'm going to vote for the Green Party if Bernie drops out, when he drops out, if that's the case. And you can cry about that. You can tell me that I am a Russian asset and my response will be, fuck you. Because after all of the time that we have spent fighting for our nominee, for our candidate, when we were in the lead, all we heard from the media for about two straight weeks was how the Bernie bros would react in the event they stole the nomination away from us. Was that the party is the one that actually has the most say during nominations, it's not actually voters. So go fuck yourselves. I am not going to fall in line. Fuck you. They think that if they spit in our faces, slap us across the face, stab us in the back, call us dickheads, and then tell us to unify that everything will be peachy king. No, that's not the way that things work. And to think that Biden can't possibly go any further left or he won't, what concession has he even fucking made? What, he adopted Elizabeth Warren's uh, bankruptcy proposal that would undo the damage that he caused? What other concessions could he make? There's nothing he can do. He's already gone so far to the left to appease Bernie Sanders, and it's not working. These people are the biggest clowns ever. They are the biggest clowns ever. And um, if they lose to Donald Trump, mark my words, they're going to blame you. They're going to blame me. They're going to blame third-party voters. They're going to blame Bernie Sanders and Bernie Sanders supporters. But just know... They made this bed and they have to lie with it, right? They're the ones who created the standard that, you know, you should stay in even if, um, you know, you lose just to make sure you can um, maybe contest the convention, um, still win out. I don't think Bernie would contest the convention, but I mean, at a minimum, he's just trying to get a plurality of pledged delegates, which is uh, more courteous than, that, than what they were willing to do to him when they just outright wanted to steal it from him. So fuck off. Bernie should stay in the race. And if you think that we're going to unify with you, we're not going to unify with you. 
So you can try all you want to bully Bernie Sanders, but, you know, eventually if he obeys you and he drops out and endorses and ultimately campaigns for Joe Biden, if you think that we're going to listen to Bernie Sanders, you've got another thing coming because I'm not voting for Joe Biden. So you're going to have to make up those votes that you're losing by pissing off progressives elsewhere. I don't know. Go to Fox News and see if you can pull in more center-right people. I don't know, but you're not getting my vote, so uh, take that and shove it. During a virtual town hall with Anderson Cooper on CNN, Joe Biden got a question from someone who most likely has COVID-19. She has all the symptoms of COVID-19 and healthcare professionals suspect that that's what she has, although she hasn't been able to confirm that because she can't get a test. Now, she explained her situation to Joe Biden and how she has to pay $2,000 per month for her family's healthcare and they have to choose between food, rent, or healthcare. Which one do they choose? And Joe Biden, as the presumptive Democratic Party nominee, if we want to call him that at this point in time, he was supposed to be a leader and reassure her that everything is going to be okay and come forward with real solutions to help people in her and her family's predicament. But what he offered instead was um, nothing more than word salad. Take a look. I'm wearing this mask to protect my family as I've been diagnosed based on my symptoms for the coronavirus. Although I cannot be tested due to the limited number of tests available here in New York City. My husband and I are both hardworking, college educated Americans who, like countless other Americans, will suffer as a result of this pandemic. I work full time for a small company that does not offer health benefits. My husband is a freelancer. We currently pay over $2,000 a month for health insurance for our family of three. My question for you is that when our savings account inevitably runs out due to him not being able to work right now, what is it that we sacrifice? Do we sacrifice food, rent, or health care? You should not have to sacrifice anything. Let me say that again. You should not have to sacrifice anything. Not just because it's the fair thing to be taking care of your entire family and every family in your circumstance, but because it's best for the whole country, the entire economy. It's not just doing a favor for any individual. Number one, your health care, you should not have to pay a penny for testing, and it should be available to you by now. We were promised it a while ago. You sh it should be available for you to be tested and determine what needs to be done. Number two, the House just passed an unemployment uh, proposal that increases by $600 the unemployment insurance should get. Whether or not you were part of, you have been covered by unemployment insurance or paid into it before, including your husband who may have been, he's a, a, uh, uh, a entrepreneur on his own, doesn't have employees. You will be covered. And that should be done, but that requires the government to be the federal government to help the states set up the unemployment offices in a way that they can handle this enormous, enormous call on the need for being the, the, the unemployment insurance. Thirdly, the cost of a test should be absolutely zero for you. Number one. And number two, I think the House and the Senate are going to have to go back and make sure. So after listening to him give that answer, ask yourself. If you were in that woman's predicament, what would you take away from that? Would you feel any better? Would you have any sort of reassurance that everything is going to be okay? That if he's elected, he's going to fix the issues that led to her being in this current predicament? Her job doesn't offer health insurance. Her husband, he does freelance work. So they have to pay $2,000 per month. I'm assuming that they, you know, are buying insurance on the exchanges that him and Obama put together. What are you going to do specifically to help her out? He offered her zero solutions. Now, he says, um, you should not have to sacrifice anything. I'll repeat that. You should not have to sacrifice anything. Well, you know, nobody should have to sacrifice anything. Nobody should have to choose between rent, food, and health care. Nobody should die because they don't have health insurance. But the reality is that they will. So, should not doesn't mean anything. What it could have, should have. Fuck are you going to do? That's the question. What are you going to do? And his answer in a nutshell, is uh, nothing. Nothing for them. Now, he always likes to number his points. You know, he'll go through point one, point two, point three. 
And um, point number two, I believe, was you should not have to pay a penny for a COVID-19 test. And then when he moved on to uh, point number three, he said the cost of the test should be zero dollars for her. Awesome. Except let's uh, extend that a little bit further. Let's assume that she tests positive for COVID-19 and uh, then she needs health care. Then what? What if her husband and baby gets it? Then what? Do you understand why these types of milk tow solutions never suffice? Why people become increasingly desperate after each successive election? It's because a free test doesn't mean anything. Healthcare is what people need. So not only should she get that test for free, of course, she should get the healthcare that she needs for free. But again, we have to extend that logic. Let's say somebody is experiencing cancer symptoms. Should that test be free? Should treatment for their cancer be free? Joe Biden would answer no. He probably wouldn't directly say it. He'd beat around the bush and use doublespeak to explain that. But his answer is no. If you don't have health care in America, Joe Biden thinks it's perfectly reasonable for you to die. He said this, he admitted this, by saying he would veto Medicare for all. He admitted this in an interview on MSNBC with Lawrence O'Donnell. In the event, a Democratic-controlled House and Senate historically passed Medicare for all, he would veto it. He would veto the bill that saves 68,000 American lives every single year. And that's a conservative estimate because it doesn't take into account underinsured people. So do you understand why when progressives and the left told Democrats that the selectability argument was bullshit? Uh, why we were so vocal about that? Because he's offering no solutions. He's offering no solutions. Can anyone name a single policy that Joe Biden has proposed? Ask the average voter. Ask a Joe Biden supporter. I bet you they couldn't name one because this man stands for nothing. He's friends with Obama and he's electable, so uh, you should vote for him in spite of his terrible record, in spite of the fact that he's going to do fuck all for Americans if he's elected. So let's say, you know, we're able to be lucky enough to kick Donald Trump out of office. Then we get Joe Biden. Then what? People continue to die or go bankrupt because they don't have health care. People continue to... um lose their homes, lose their jobs because of COVID-19, and you won't offer a federal jobs guarantee, no Medicare for all, no robust solutions that would actually fix the problems that we're dealing with? Like, what do we have to look forward to? What do we have to look forward to? Because the Democrats don't want to offer us any real solutions. They want to nibble around the edges and tell us to shut the fuck up and accept our crumbs. And when we say we want more than crumbs, then they uh, try to browbeat us and guilt trip us into supporting their shitty politicians. Like, do you understand why so many people don't come out to vote? Because Democrats aren't offering them anything. This used to be the party of the working class, and now look at them. They're a bunch of clowns. They are a bunch of clowns. Pink hat wearing Republicans. That's what they are. They don't actually care about helping people. The only thing that they care about, the ones in power, are keeping their jobs, keeping their seats warm, making sure that, you know, their futures will be intact. But for regular Americans who don't have access to wealth or power, they couldn't care less about us. And Joe Biden proved it. Even if he wanted to, or uh, could have been able to articulate a clear vision, does anyone believe that it would have been sufficient? Does anyone believe that that mother and her family would have felt, you know, like they had a reason to support him? Of course not. So that was absolutely embarrassingly pathetic. And I genuinely feel bad for her. There are so many people in this predicament. So many people I know personally who lost their jobs or who work in healthcare. And they're the one provider for the family because daycare is too expensive and they're working with COVID-19 people, testing them. Like, people are watching the world devolve into chaos and they're worried about losing their livelihoods. And the best thing that Democrats could do right now 
is assured them with a huge policy vision that everything's going to be okay because they have fixes to all of these problems. But what they're doing is offering nothing. They're putting up an alleged rapist with a uh, you know, cognitive decline. And they're telling us we better be happy with this. Otherwise, we're to blame if Donald Trump wins. Yeah. Well, we'll see about that. Because if you lose again... You have to take responsibility. Now, I know that that's a joke because they won't. But um, don't let them guilt trip you into thinking that you're responsible for their losses. Their incompetence is what led to their defeat if, you know, Joe Biden, in fact, loses. So I'll leave that there. All right, folks, that's all that I've got for you today. As usual, we're not going to end the show without thanking all of our Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members. You all are the lifeblood of the show. You help us not just to survive, but thrive. And I cannot thank you enough. You're incredible. So, um, yeah, that's what we've got. Hopefully, you guys um, enjoyed that. The episode's have been longer than usual. I've been trying to make up for the fact that we haven't been doing interviews. I want to resume them, but um, we'll see how that works because all of the candidates that I had interviewed, I did those and I didn't reschedule anymore. I don't know how campaigns are campaigning during this global pandemic, but I'd like to talk to them and see how they're doing. So I'm hoping to restart that soon. If not, we'll have something else in mind. Um, so um, yeah, Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. I already said that, but whatever. I'm tired now. I'm just rambling. I'll see you all next week. Take care, everybody.